This week's Creeps Cast is sponsored by Coinbase. For a limited time, new users can get $10 in free Bitcoin when you sign up today at coinbase.com slash mrcreeps. Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing well. For some reason, I'm in a really good mood today, so let's get into the stories and get things going. As we drift further into Mr. Creep's mind. My May Security Guard at an Abandoned Warehouse Written by Valor Angel My May Security Guard through a company. Well, never mind. I guess it doesn't matter in knowing the type of people who read these things. They'll try and get a job at this company in hopes to have an encounter. I've been in security for my entire adult life so far. Right out of high school, I got a job offer, checking in trucks to go unload at shipping docks. It's a fairly laid back job, but this was different. I'm now 23 and I've never experienced anything like that post before in my life. I'm not new to the paranormal or things that go bump in the night. Almost all of my family has had encounters with all sorts of paranormal creatures. From ghosts to cryptids and everything in between. Someone in my family has probably seen it or knows someone who has. My father and grandfather have had an encounter with the Beast of Bray Road multiple times between the two of them. My grandmother has had experiences with ghosts and I've seen what are called shadow people at an old abandoned sanitarium named Waverly Hills. You would expect someone who has come to grips with the paranormal sense they were a small child would not get frightened easily. Well, that couldn't be further from the truth. What I saw was unimaginable, evil, and then I pray every night for those who will ever encounter it as well. It all started so calm and peaceful. The perfect post with plenty of downtime and great pay and a fast track to upper management. I guess if it sounds too good to be true, then well, it probably is. The first eight hours of my shift went by without a hedge. My shifts lasted from 1800 all the way until 600. I preferred night shifts being that I was still fairly young and I was a night owl by nature. My job consisted of three major post orders. One, to ensure that no one steps foot on property unless authorized by my supervisor. Two, to do patrols alongside the exterior perimeter of the site every other hour on the dot. And three, make sure that no one enters the abandoned warehouse to my back left from the guard shack and to find anyone who enters as quickly as possible. It seems straightforward, with motion-activated cameras and a well-maintained path around the perimeter of the site. What could go wrong? The first two hours of my shift was just meant for the shift change to talk over anything that might have happened on the previous shift, with the guard that I was relieving of duty. The rest of the shift consisted of patrols every other hour for the remainder of the shift. Each patrol roughly took 30 minutes to complete, and nothing ever happened except maybe the occasional animal, like a deer or a rabbit being seen past the fence in the adjacent field. It was time for me to start my first patrol when I found a list of rules in the high-vis vest on the back of my chair. What the heck, not this again. I've seen this prank played out too many times in my years in this field. Everyone loves to leave a list of magical rules for the new guy to follow and is scared to looking behind his back every 30 seconds while out on patrol. I decided to at least read the rules to see if they were at the very least creative. Rule number one, never enter the abandoned warehouse between the hours of midnight and 4 a.m. Rule number two, if for any reason that rule number one is broken, there is a handgun and cross in the security office of the building hidden under the desk if you need them. Rule number three, never say thank God or Jesus at any point while in the building. You'll only make it angry. Rule number four, never at any point look behind you while in the building. 
and keep your eyes locked in front of you and maintain a brisk pace. You don't want to see it, and if you do, may God help your soul. Rule number five. If you hear a child crying or whispering to you, run as fast as you can out of the building and call your supervisor immediately. Rule number six. If you stumble upon any staircase leading below grade, walk the other way immediately or else you will encounter it. Rule number seven. Always have a source of light, no matter how dim it is. It and the cross provided in the security office are the only things that will keep it at a distance. If you lose one, you best hope that you don't lose the other. The failure to follow any of these rules will result in a serious injury or death. And I cannot guarantee your safety if you fail to follow these rules at any point. Signed, Tim Burton. What the heck? Tim would never pull a prank like this. He's too by the books and a no-nonsense. I've worked under him since I've started, and there's no way this is actually written by him. I felt a sense of uneasiness and cold, beads of sweat coming from my forehead. What the heck are those rules? How was a flashlight and a cross going to stop whatever it was? Suddenly, my alarm on my wristwatch started blaring, letting me know that it was 8pm and time for my first perimeter patrol. The list had me pretty shaken up. What did it mean by it? Did Tim really write those rules? Is that why the pay is so good for this post? I proceeded on with my duties and completed each patrol. I felt like I was being watched the entire time when I was outside of the guard shack. My mind kept racing back to the list every single time with any sound other than the ones that I was making. And then came time for the 2 a.m. patrol. That's when I saw what looked like a young girl, no older than four, giggling and running into the warehouse. I jumped up and grabbed my high visibility vest when I remembered rule number one. Never enter the abandoned warehouse between the times of midnight and 4 a.m., this can't be happening. Wasn't there something about a child in the rules? I proceeded to pull out the list and read until I came to rule number five. If you hear a child crying or whispering to you, run as fast as you can and call your supervisor immediately. Was this the child that rule number five had mentioned? There's no way these rules are real, right? Fear washed over me as I stood there thinking... What the heck am I supposed to do? I can't lose this job. My wife had just found out that she was pregnant with our first child three months ago. I have to go in and find this little girl, even if there is a small chance that the rules are real. I made my approach to the warehouse's entrance and felt like I was being watched, like someone or something was right behind me, breathing down my neck. The stone stairs leading up to the door of the entrance were cracked with weeds, growing between the stone that was once well-maintained for decades. The door itself was a large glass door with old signs and posters, either torn or worn to the point that they were no longer readable. As I entered, I felt an overwhelming sense of dread and hatred like I entered an animal's nest uninvited. This had once been a popular spot for teenagers to come and get into all sorts of trouble, and doing anything you could imagine a young rebellious teenager would do. That was until a group of three teenage boys were found dead throughout the building after a fourth called 9-11, frantically begging for help. The fourth boy was never found, and is still missing to this day. The reception hall was covered in graffiti and trash splattered across the floor with no regard for the once beautiful tile that lay underneath it. I've seen pictures of the building from its heyday, and it was a real beautiful sight to behold. It makes you wonder what made them abandon it. The building never went up for sale publicly, and it was acquired by the government eventually, after the company had filed for bankruptcy. There's been rumors that the four boys were sacrificed by some kind of satanic ritual, 
trying to bring forth a demon into this world, but I never took any stock in it. It always seemed to be one of those spooky stories told over the campfire, by some kid trying to scare and impress his friends like so many other stories before it. I snapped out of the admiration of the beauty of what the building would have looked like once before, decades ago, and I remembered rule number two. If for any reason rule number one is broken, with a handgun and a cross in the security office of the building, hidden under the desk and you'll need them. The security office was right next to the entrance by the receptionist desk. I reached for my key ring at my waist when I heard it. A child crying. Fear shot over my once a blank face as panic set in. I fumbled the keys faster and with even more haste with each passing second. Whatever was making that noise was a no child. It had a dark, raspy undertone to it, just barely able to be heard by my own ears. I remembered rule number seven. Always have a source of light, no matter how dim it may be. It and the cross provided in the security office are the only things that will keep it at a distance. If you lose one, you better hope that you don't lose the other. That ah, crap. It was coming closer and almost was at the top of the steps, adjacent to me on my right when I finally found the right key and hurried into the guard's office, slamming the door shut behind me. Holy crap, what was that? Are these rules actually real? There's no way. I quickly located the desk to the far left corner of the pitch black room, and underneath it was a box labeled, Emergency Use Only. I approached the box and I opened it. Inside was a small wooden cross and a Glock 17, with two spare magazines of 9mm ammo. Jesus, the rules they have have to be real. There's too many coincidences for them not to be real. I analyzed the wooden cross finding the word protect inscribed on the old wood. When I heard a deafening smash in the front lobby from which I just came, to the sound of a children crying. Holy crap, this isn't happening. I had just broken rule number three. Never say thank God or Jesus at any point while in the building. You'll only make it angry. Whatever the thing is, whatever it means, it's right outside of the guard office and it's pissed off. I sat there in the office for the next hour and 45 minutes, but I'm truth that it felt like days had passed. When I checked my watch, I realized that I had five minutes left until whatever this thing is supposed to go away from whatever pit that it came from. I gathered my thoughts and opened up the guard office door and bolted towards the front door for my freedom. When I tried to open the door, it was locked. Did you really think it was going to be that easy? You still got an hour with me. I froze in place, mortified by the fear. I looked down to check my watch and it was right. It read 3 a.m. What? That's not possible, it just read 3.55. I sat there frozen in place, waiting to meet my fate at the hands of whatever this demonic entity is, but it never came. I sat there frozen as I heard a little girl's laughter ring down the hallway. Whatever this thing is, it doesn't want to kill me just yet. It wants to make me suffer and slip into insanity with its games and its taunts. I have to find a way out of here quickly, before this sick game loses its spark of enjoyment. I turned and faced what lay ahead of me. To my left, a hall that continued for what seemed like forever towards the shipping docks. That wasn't going to be any good, as all these shipping docks were sealed and closed when the warehouse was abandoned, and there was no escaping in that direction. And to my right was the flight of stairs that I originally had heard the demon from. And then there was straight ahead, where I just went laughing all the way, into the deep dark abyss that awaited. I bit my tongue and chose the stairs and prayed to God that I had made the correct choice. The stairs led to a locker room area, 
The entire locker room was smeared in blood. I saw the corpse of what I can only presume was a previous victim, laying there motionless and is cold as stone, with dried blood on the wall spilling out. Welcome home. I was horrified by the sight of it. I felt like vomiting when I heard it. Isn't it beautiful when they sleep? Soon, you'll join him and be at peace. That's why they brought me here so that everyone can experience the eternal sleep where there is no war, no pain and no sorrow, and to think I'm viewed as the evil one. I quickly rushed down the staircase on the other end of the room, remembering rule number four. Never at any point look behind you while in the building. Keep your eyes locked in front of you and maintain a brisk pace. You won't want to see it, and if you do, may God help your soul. I ran down the stairwell as fast as I could, but I tripped and fell hard destroying my flashlight and losing the cross in the process. I had to keep going on, so I did. I went on and on for what must have been three or four flights of stairs. I saw a doorway with what appeared to be the first glimpse of daylight. I looked at my watch and it said, 557, and I felt a sudden rush of joy watch over me, until I heard it, and got you. I would like to extend a huge thank you to Coinbase for sponsoring today's podcast. Have you ever heard about the cryptocurrency craze but haven't taken the time to get involved yet? Well, now is a great time to take the plunge. Coinbase makes it quick and easy to start your own portfolio and learn to trade like a pro. Now I'm a big fan of diversifying my assets and over time, cryptocurrency has become a hugely important staple of my overall financial outlook. Even though it seemed imposing at first, Coinbase helped me from the very start by keeping it simple and providing me with all the tools that I needed for success. Coinbase offers a trusted and easy to use platform to buy, sell, and spend a cryptocurrency. As a testament to that, millions of people from over 100 countries trust Coinbase with their digital assets. For a limited time, new users can get $10 in free Bitcoin when you sign up today at coinbase.com slash mrcreeps. Sign up at coinbase.com slash mrcreeps for $10 in free Bitcoin. This offer is for a limited time only, so be sure to sign up today. That's coinbase.com slash mrcreeps. Stay out of Mammoth Cave National Park. Written by Valor Angel. I have always loved the woods. Ever since I was a small child, I found more comfort in them than anywhere else. It wasn't until my adult life that this had changed. It all started on a normal camping trip during a cold November weekend. Most people would have canceled the trip due to it recently raining and with a high of 37 all weekend long. However, I enjoyed the extra challenge. The trip was to Mammoth Cave National Park in South Central Kentucky. For those of you who aren't in the know, Mammoth Cave is the largest cave system in the world, with a beautiful national park full of amazing trails and places to go canoeing and all your other favorite outdoor activities. That is, of course, on a surface level. Many locals know not to go on the north side of the park at night alone, or even in a small group. Quite a few people have gone missing over the years, and very seldom is it on the south side of the park. The park is split down the middle by the Green River, which stretches across the park from east to west, connecting Nolan Lake to Green River Lake, both of which being popular spots during the summer for camping. Everyone's uncle had seen Bigfoot in these woods. Heck, I'm sure that they also shared a sandwich a time or two. I've never believed in the paranormal. I think that it can be all explained away by logic and reasoning. You saw a ghost. Yeah, right, that's just your brain imagining it. 
did that light turn off on its own? Sure, you might want to call the electrician to fix the crappy job the first electrician did while the house was being built. In saying that, I will admit that I do enjoy a good story. Especially creepy ones found across the internet. Especially those of the local urban legend across Kentucky of the Goatman or the Barilla. For those of you who don't know what the Barilla is, it is a local legend in South Central Kentucky about an animal frequently seen at Native American burial grounds and local cemeteries at the edge of small towns. It's described as having short black or gray fur, with a massive waist and even larger arms. They didn't get the name Barilla for nothing. Its head is being described as that of a larger wolf with long pointy ears, amber eyes and a short stubby snout. Some have described it more along the lines of what a stereotypical werewolf would look like. And for the goat man, well we have all heard that tale, I don't think it needs any introduction. Anyways, back to the camping trap. I was going alone this time. I thought about bringing my son along as he had just recently turned 13, and I felt more comfortable taking him on longer, harsher trips with minimal gear. He always seemed to enjoy camping, but this one was a little out of his league. It was too cold and the trail was too harsh and unforgiving for anyone without proper experience. The trip itself was over the course of two days. The first was hiking up to the site which was set up on the highest point in the park. And the next was of course a slow hike back which in all honesty would be even more dangerous due to the rapid drop in elevation combined with the cold slick mud and clay that would be found on the trail. I always made sure to pack lightly on hiking trips like this to really push myself when it came to my survival skills. On this trip, I carried with me a small knife, two 50-foot strands of 550 paracord, my tent and sleeping bag and some iodine tablets to purify the water of any harmful bacteria that I found. A small flashlight really only strong enough to illuminate 10 to 15 feet in front of me, and then of course a fire starter and some duct tape. Overall, I packed more than I normally would for such a trip. However, with the recent birth of my second child a few months ago, I started to take less risks and I packed more each time. For food, I brought with me a pack of beef jerky and some granola bars. That's really all that I needed to feed my slim frame of 150 pounds at 5'11". The time came for me to leave for my trip. Getting in the truck, I felt a cold feeling wash over me. Like a sixth sense telling me not to go on this trip, but of course I ignored it. I'd already taken off work for the two days that I would be gone. And I'm not about to waste the few precious vacation days that I got each year. The drive itself should only take three hours depending on the ferry still used by the park. The ferry was the quickest and easiest way to get across to the north side of the park. Without adding an extra two to three hours onto the drive. It was a common complaint to those who came on vacation from out of state. However, us locals usually took the chance to catch up on a new book, or to double check our gear in case we had forgotten to pack something, while waiting for the ferry to reach the south side boarding dock. I was currently reading A Game of Thrones for the third time. It took the ferry only about 45 minutes to get back on the south side, but when the crew stepped off, they went to each of our vehicles to tell us, due to the increase in wind, and with the currents being strong today, there would be no more rides across the water. Men and wanting to get across would have to go around and take a bridge to get across, the closest one being an hour and a half drive away from the docks. This at the time it upset me, however, I understood why they couldn't risk the journey across to the other dock, and so I went on my way. It was a fairly long and boring drive. There was no use in bringing my cell phone due to there being no signal anywhere in the park. Even on the tallest peak of the park, you wouldn't get anything. Now I know what people are going to say, you should still bring your cell phone when you go out camping. 
and to that I agree, but I hated the distraction of it. It always pulled my attention from nature and I also just didn't want to deal with another piece of equipment that I would need to keep track of. Remember, in my mind, the lighter is the better. Originally, I had planned to get to the parking lot at the beginning of the trail by 9am. However, it was now noon and I only had about a good 7 hours of daylight left. This meant that I wouldn't be able to make it to the camping grounds at the end of the trail by nightfall. This isn't the first time that this has happened to me, however, but I always hated it when it did. Hiking up these steep incline, even in perfect conditions at night, was dangerous and heavily advised against by park rangers, so I would have to make do and set up camp at the first area that I could find after sunset, and then start and wake up early tomorrow to catch up on the three hours that I had lost due to the ferry. The first three hours of the hike went perfect. I saw a timber rattlesnake. If you ever visit the eastern United States, watch out for those. Not only are they big and strong for a snake, but they are also very, and I mean very, venomous. Once I had hit the 5 hour mark on my hike, I had run out of water for the second time and needed to refill my bottle since this was the last chance you get until you make your way back down. I was going to go for another 30 minutes or so before I made camp. There's a nice clearing up ahead that, if I can get to, then it'll be in good shape to make up for the lost time tomorrow. While refilling my water, I noticed a paw print in the mud, seven feet off to my left on the bank. It was undoubtedly a canine print, left from what I presumed was a coyote coming to stop for some water sometime in the last 24 hours. That was until I got closer to the print and realized just how massive it was. Now, I'm a smoker and I smoke about a pack a day, and while this print was two packs long and slightly bigger than one pack wide. And then let me translate that for all the non-smoking readers. Whatever made this print was massive. There's no way a coyote made this print, but there aren't any wolves in Kentucky either. There are also no dog breeds that I know of that have prints that big. Whatever made this was massive and well... I had no intentions of staying there by the river to wait for its return. I hurried back onto the trail this time with more pep in my step so I could hurry and set up camp to offer some protection of whatever the thing that made that print was still around. I made it to the clearing and set up camp just as the sunset was starting to fade into dusk. First, I quickly set my tent up and threw my sleeping bag inside followed by starting the fire. There was a predator out there in those woods. The fire would keep them at a distance for a while, at least I thought. I next used my two strands of paracord and tied them around the campsite at any level to act like as a tripwire for anyone or anything coming out of the campsite to give myself a few more precious seconds of time to react. I finally sat down and torn to the pack of jerky that I had packed. This gave me some comfort and relaxation as now I had food in my stomach and a fire to keep me warm. But then I heard a snap. My blood went cold as my mind went a million miles an hour as to what could have made that noise. Was it a person? Could it just be some sort of animal like a deer just passing through? What if it was that creature that made the print back down at the river? Whatever it was, it was large and heavy as I heard twigs snapping louder and louder as it drew closer. Who's out there? Announce yourself. No answer came. I'll have a gun and I'll shoot if you don't announce yourself. It was a lie, however. It was a bluff that had gotten a response countless times over the years. However, still no answer came. Whatever was making these noises was heavy. It had to have at least been several hundred pounds for it to make twigs snap that loud, like there were bones being broken with each and every step. That's also when I noticed just how much distance the creature had covered in only a few seconds. Whatever it was, it, it couldn't be human. Its pace was too slow for the amount of ground covered, and the steps were too loud and powerful for it to be a person. Some time had passed before I heard anything else. 
The steps had stopped just outside of the light that my fire reproduced. Whatever this thing was, it was smart and understood to stay out of the light, where it could see me and I couldn't see it. And there we stayed for what felt like an eternity, unmoving, trying desperately to stretch the little bit of spare wood I gathered to keep the fire going as long as possible. It was waiting for the fire to die out, but I wouldn't let it. I couldn't let this thing get its chance to attack me in the dark. I knew that if it really wanted me, all it would have to do was come right into the camp and have me for dinner, but it never came. Some time had passed and the fire had come to its small, desperate final breast of life. When I decided to head into my tent, thinking the creature had moved on to choose another target. But that's when I saw it. Those awful amber eyes, cold and without emotion. They struck utter fear into me. This creature was massive. It had to have been at least eight to nine feet tall. I couldn't see the body. It was too dark for that, but those eyes, those cold, terrible eyes will haunt me for the rest of my days. I still see them to this day every night laying awake and in my sleep. I quickly turned my flashlight on and saw the large, lanky frame of this beast. Its dark, black fur covered up what was undoubtedly an impressive and horrifying amount of muscle for its build. That's when I realized the putrid stench that had come with it. In my fear, I had not noticed the foul smell of death and wrath that followed this creature. It only took the smallest moment to react and drop down on all fours and let out the lowest, most awful growl that I had ever heard. It could be felt in my soul and the anger and hatred this thing possessed could only be described as pure evil incarnate. I quickly hurried into my tent and hid for the gruesome end that was about to come my way. Praying not to any specific deity but anyone or anything out there who could hear me. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Please, God, save me. I don't want to die. I heard the creature approach right up on the tent, sniffing and growling at me. I swear I don't think my heart had beat a single time. What felt like hours had passed without a sound, and then it was gone. Its howls could be heard off into the distance, reminding me that I was lucky to not end up as it supper tonight. I didn't sleep for even a second that night. I mean, how could I? I had just experienced the face of pure evil. Malice itself, a given form into our world. I knew that I shouldn't be alive, and that the only reason I did not die that night was by its choice and that alone. When dawn broke, I exited my tent and found evidence of the creature all over the campsite. Pieces of fur, paw prints, and claw marks on nearby trees, just to name a few. This trend continued on the trail back to the car. I never made it to the end of the trail. As soon as I packed up camp, I hightailed it out of the woods. I knew if I was to encounter that creature again, I wouldn't be so lucky next time. When I got to the car, I threw my backpack into the back seat and hurried into the front seat of the car, not saying a word. I sat there in silence with my face in my palms. But when I looked up, I saw its amber eyes staring at me, looking at me with a pleased expression on its face of the terror and trauma that it had caused me. This thing, it was intelligent. It wasn't after me to kill her for sport. It was after me to make me suffer. Like human suffering was its way of feeding. The look of pleasure on its face, that grin with its long terrible yellow teeth showing. God, why is such a creature allowed to exist in this world? What grave sin have I committed to be tortured by this thing's existence? I started the car's engine and drove off, driving well over the speed limit. Every now and then, when I would stop at a stop sign, 
I would swear that I saw those amber eyes, but each time when I looked again, they were gone. When I got to the north side of the park's docks, I waited there patiently as the ferry slowly made its way back. When the crew finally came up to my car, they stopped and remarked how pale I looked, like I had seen a ghost. I knew they wouldn't believe my story, so I brushed it off as the cold weather taking its toll. I rode home in silence. The radio was turned off and I was left to my own thoughts, racing through my mind about the creature. When I arrived home late that night, my wife had already put our daughter to sleep, and my son was off at some friend's house playing Halo 3 and having a good time. I sat there on the couch contemplating what had happened out there on that trip. I decided to head to bed soon after that. When I had opened the door, my wife Sarah had remarked that I stunk, and it was like I had been sprayed by a skunk. My blood ran cold. I smelled it too now. That awful, putrid stench. I made sure not to make a face and dismissed her claim, and I went to take a shower. As I got done, I looked out the window and there it was, illuminated by the streetlight with that insidious grin on its face. It had followed me home, and saw the fear on my face, all the joy that must have given it. It's been two months since that camping trip, and every night it returns, sometimes brushing up against the side of the house, other times staring through the window, and others howling in the distance. It made sure that I understood that it wasn't going anywhere. I had done some digging online and found out the creature was the Barilla. It had other names as well like Dogman and the Beast of Bray Road. It's been three months since I found out what this creature was. I've been in contact with God knows how many experts to try and rid this thing from my existence. Each attempt became more and more desperate, and with each attempt, the Dogman's pleasure grew and knew that I was desperate to rid myself of it. I cannot keep living my life this way. When you find that, I'll be gone by the time you find this. Just know that I love you and that I'm sorry. I will not give the creature the pleasure it seeks so adamantly. I'm sorry. I love you all and when you read this, please sell the house and move as far away from Mammoth Cave as you can. When it learns that I have ended myself, it will come for one of you next. There is something sinister residing in the Eastern Island statues, written by Sugar Sod. This story was shared with me by my grandfather, who was a part of a team of scientists researching the giant statues on Easter Island. This transpired in the first half of the 20th century. I was the youngest member of our 10-person team and was given most of the grunt work as everyone regarded me as their inferior being the new guy. I didn't mind doing the work as I was looking forward to working with a bunch of professionals. I was fresh out of college and this was my first real job in the field. The boat ride to the island was a torture for me, as I spent most of the journey there vomiting due to seasickness. As you can expect, most of the crew were laughing at me due to my head hanging over the side of the boat every few hours. And the rest of our team were unaffected by the journey, which furthered my embarrassment. It was a long and arduous journey as the island is so remote. It is over 2,000 kilometers from the nearest other island. I had never felt such relief as the moment that I finally set foot on land again. The other older team members began barking orders at me and I rushed around grabbing the equipment off the boat. The captain told us that 
he would be back in a month's time. And if we had any problems, then unfortunately, we were on our own. I felt a weird sense of foreboding as I watched the boat disappear off into the distance. The others stood alongside me for a few moments, and I'm not sure if they were thinking the same thing that I was. We spent the next few hours setting up our camp and organizing all their supplies. The person leading our group was called Andrew, and he was continuously glaring at me as I moved from one task to another. We eventually had everything set up, and Andrew told us all to go to sleep early, as we had a long day ahead of us tomorrow. I had the best night's sleep in ages, and I wasn't being awoken by the rocking of the waves like I was on the ship. I was awoken the next morning by sounds of movement outside my tent. I quickly got dressed and started helping the others with breakfast. We devoured our food and then we prepared to head out. Unsurprisingly, I was given the bulk of the stuff to carry, as Andrew didn't want to overburden the others. We reached the first giant statue and stood awestruck in front of it. The head towered over us, and it made me feel so insignificant. Andrew snapped his fingers at us, and we were dragged from our reverie. We all began setting up our equipment so that we could study this giant head and hopefully learn a bit more about it. I was instructed by Andrew to use a hammer to smash a piece off as he wanted some samples. I tried to argue that we shouldn't damage them, but he began scolding me and I was ordered to do it, otherwise I wouldn't be paid. I reluctantly walked up to the head and tried to look for a spot that I could easily break off. I placed my hand against the side and was surprised at how warm it felt. I found a piece that had been previously damaged and I smashed the hammer against it. The entire statue began to shake and I took a few steps back in shock. The eyes of the statue seemed to be glaring at me, and I had never felt so terrified. I rushed over to the others and explained what had just happened, and they followed me to the statue. None of them spotted anything out of the ordinary, and Andrew slapped me across the face and told me to stop being a nuisance. He picked up a piece that I had broken off and led the others back to where they had their equipment set up. I spent the rest of the day helping the others but kept a constant wary eye on the statue. We left our equipment behind at the end of the day when we were headed back to camp as there was no point in charting it back and forth. That night, I got up to go to the bathroom and went to a short distance from the camp. I felt something staring at me, and I looked around thinking that it was another one of the team members nearby. My blood went cold as I saw the statue only a short distance away. I began to back up, but it didn't move. I awoke all the others and brought them over to where I had seen it. They searched around, but they couldn't find anything. They gave me sympathetic looks and told me that it was just a nightmare. I slept badly that night, as I kept expecting a giant shadow to appear hovering over my tent. The next morning, we made the long walk back to where we had left our equipment. I was lagging behind the others, as I didn't want to be anywhere near that bloody statue. I heard annoyed shouting ahead of me, and rushed forward to see what was going on. I stopped in shock as I saw that all of our equipment lying was smashed and spread all over the ground. 
Everything was beyond salvaging, and they were so utterly broken. I moved towards the statue from yesterday, and I know that it sounds crazy, but it had moved. It had been facing away from the camp yesterday, but now it was looking towards our destroyed equipment. Two other statues were also in the distance, but none had been nearby when we were here yesterday. I pointed this out to Andrew, but he was too annoyed about the destroyed equipment to even pay attention. Andrew decided to move our camp to beside the statue, as it at least that way we could have our equipment beside us at all times. I considered telling Andrew this was a terrible idea, but I knew that he would never listen to me anyway. The following morning, I was awoken by screams from one of the group members. I rushed outside to find everyone standing around something on the ground. I made my way over and almost fainted as I gazed down at the bloody remains. It looked like whoever it was had been crushed as their body had been liquefied. We did a quick head count and realized that it was Luke who was the second in command. The others began urging Andrew that we needed to leave but he ignored them and began ordering everyone to get to work. We knew that we had no choice but to do as he said, as we were trapped here until the boat returned. We considered going to the locals for help, but we were worried that they might have been responsible for what had happened. I was tasked with gathering up Luke's remains so that we could properly bury him. I ended up having to use a shovel and a bucket as there were no solid pieces left of his body. Even his bones had been broken beyond recognition. I was looking around me as I did this, as more statues had appeared overnight. There was almost a dozen of them watching us now. I could see that the others had noticed the new statues as well, as they kept shooting terrified glances towards them. Andrew, for some reason, seemed oblivious to them, as he was concentrating on getting his research completed. Every morning, we woke up to find more and more statues appearing around our camp. They were surrounding us. Three more of our team were found dead. Their bodies had been crushed, but their heads had been left intact. Their faces had died with expressions of pure terror etched across them. I was forced to use the shovel to separate their heads as I needed to collect the remains. I ended up dumping them at the edge of camp. There was no point in burying them anymore. I didn't know what to do. So I began discussing with the remaining crew about grabbing what was left of our supplies and heading somewhere different, anywhere away from these statues. Obviously, Andrew told me that I was just being a nuisance again and that the dead crew members had all passed of natural causes. I looked into his face and I came to the sickening realization that he had lost his freaking mind. There was no doubt about it. The next morning, I woke up to an eerily silent camp. I made my way out of my tent. The statues had encircled the camp almost completely, and they were all gazing inwards towards me, looming over me. I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. I turned to see Andrew preparing to start work on his equipment. I made my way over towards them and stopped as I saw the remains of the others. Their bodies had been crushed much like before and it looked like something had shoved them into the ground as they were almost a meter down. 
I approached Andrew and reminded him that the boat was coming tomorrow and that we needed to leave. I took a step back when he turned around and gazed into his empty eye sockets. He smiled at me and told me that he couldn't leave until he had finished his work. I was really freaking out by this point, so I said forget him. I decided to just grab my stuff and leave. It took me almost an hour to get out of the camp, as these statues were arrayed so tightly around us. I found a small gap and I began to slip through. I began to panic as these statues slowly moved and started to crush me, closing in on my body. Luckily, I managed to squeeze my way out, but the skin had been ripped off my body in numerous places. I made my way down the hill and gazed back for a moment to see that the statues had now turned and they were all facing me. I couldn't see any sign of Andrew, but knew that they would deal with him like they had for the rest of our camp. I started to weep in happiness the next morning as I saw the boat approaching. The captain greeted me and asked if anyone else was coming. He didn't seem surprised when I explained that I was the only one left alive. He began giving orders quickly to his crew while giving fearful glances towards the island. We were quickly underway as it was clear the crew wanted to leave as soon as possible. I stood on the back of the ship and watched the island slowly disappear into the distance. I could see hundreds of the statues lining the beaches and looking back at me. I'm not sure if they let me leave or if I had somehow managed to escape. All I know is that I will never trust another statue as long as I live. I'm an underwater archaeologist. What I explored might doom us all. Written by Avatar of Horror. We know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the depths of the ocean. Hearing that fact growing up always bothered me, as it meant the Earth has so many mysteries right here just waiting to be explored. While others looked outward, I looked in and focused and found purpose in learning and gaining knowledge of things. My passion in life became archaeology, particularly underwater archaeology. Would it surprise you to learn how many ancient cities and towns now exist only underwater? Archaeological sites such as Atlet Yam, Bei, and Pavlo Petri show just how much can be lost over time to the ocean waves. I was working at a field site when I got an unexpected call from a pier. Hey Diego, how goes it? I answered. Good, good, my friend. Sorry to call you out of the blue, but are you still working over there in Egypt? Yes, actually, I am working with the Pythias Corporation for Underwater Analysis of Thanis Heraklion. Great, great. Hey, listen, I have a job opportunity for you. Diego rushed through the call. Usually, he made much more small talk. Oh, and as I said, I'm working for Pythia. How long do we go back together? Diego interrupted. Over a decade, back when we were doing the exploration of Olaus. But then you went and joined up with that Japanese Sabanta Corp. Well, I need your help. I've got something big, real big. Here at Sabanta and I, I need someone that I can trust with me. His voice was labored. Sounds serious, um, are you okay? Yeah, well, let's just say, it'll be better if I can get you here to help. Well, I just can't walk off the job. This expedition took months to arrange. 
Sabanta, why, we'll be reimbursing Pythias if you come. I paused. What's with the cloak and dagger, Diego? What aren't you telling me? There was a long silence on the other end of the line. I can't say much unless you agree to come, but suffice it to say, we found something incredible on a recent underwater scan. There's only a few people in the world who do underwater archaeology, and of those, you are the only one that I can trust. There is another pause. Please, you'll be compensated insanely for this. Like, imagine a number, and I'll add more to that. It should only be a few weeks of work. I sighed. I'm probably going to regret this, but if you need help that badly, I'll come. I owe you after all. Thank you, truly. I'll send you over the details, including flights to and then transport on a ship, departure out of Okinawa. Okinawa? Yes, you'll be meeting us at sea. What have you gotten me into here, Diego? Well, what I can say is that it might be the mystery you always said you were looking for. I spotted the vessel that I was meeting up with from fairly far away. It was a large ship with the logo of a Sabanto Corp emblazoned on it. When my transport pulled up to it, Diego was waiting for me up top. Getting on board with my pack, Diego didn't have his normal exuberance. I'm sorry again for all of this, but I promise it'll be worthwhile. Diego came over and helped me lift my bag and ushered me to follow him. We went into the bowels of the Sabanto vessel. I've been on many exploration ships in my life, and this ship was as state-of-the-art as it came. I followed Diego to a room with what seemed to be piles of charts and data, and he hurriedly closed the door behind him, while walking back to the table and he gestured it down to them. What do you know of the Yonaguni Pyramids? Diego breathed heavily. I shrugged. Underwater formations off the coast of Yonaguni that look like step pyramids and almost certain to be geological despite their shape. The place was popular with pseudo-archaeology fanatics, which made me roll my eyes a bit. Diego nodded. And that's what everyone including the Japanese government has thought as well. He pulled out a graph chart. May's Sabanto ship was doing oil surveying in the area, and they picked up these readings. I walked over to the chart. What am I looking at? Diego pointed to the repeating lines in the graph. It's some sort of signal or emission. I waited. And? And it's coming from inside the structure. Look, it's not a one-off. It repeats on a regular interval before just stopping. There was an earthquake a few weeks ago, and just after the signal was detected, Sabanto decided to investigate further. Diego pulled out another chart. You can see from this recent topological scan, a cave entrance has opened up. I'm not sure I like where this is going. Well, we sent in a drone sub, and there is definitely an entrance to the formation down there. We mapped it as far as possible with sonar, and it leads to some sort of alcove. Diego's eyes were wide as he went through the map. There are areas inside there, and for whatever reason, outside scans don't show anything through the rock surface. We need to go down and get in there and find out what may be in there. Diego put his hand on my shoulder. This could be the greatest discovery of our field. I paused a bit before responding, looking at the chart of the newly revealed entrance. You saved my life back in Olaus, and that was due to me being an idiot and exploring an unsafe and unexplored area. Are we not just repeating that same mistake rushing into this? A grim look appeared on Diego's face, one that I had never seen before, as he leaned in closer to me. Sabanto has been having me search up and down the Pacific the last ten years, searching for unexplained phenomena and locations. When they found out about this, let's just say they have been rumored to make people disappear to get what they want, and they wanted this more than anything. You don't just get to say no to the Sabanto Corp. 
Nothing about this felt right, and every instinct told me to abandon this endeavor. But the look on Diego's face told me that I was already in too deep. The Yonaguni site is about 26 meters underwater, so it was diveable, if a bit difficult. The dark blue of the ocean greeted me as I jumped off the Sabanto ship, as the cold Pacific water hit my wetsuit. The sun was shining brightly above and rays pierced the ocean veil to illuminate the site below. The rock formation, for I refused to call it a pyramid, spread out downward. Each was layered on top of the other with layers stepping downward into the rest of the ocean basalt. Bubbles from the others diving with me obscured my view for a moment. And Diego was in front and three other Sabanto employees had joined us. Dr. Yui Amagawa was struggling a bit with her scuba gear. Diego told me she was an expert in geology but only had a moderate amount of diving experience so to keep an eye on her as we went. On my right was a short man in his wetsuit had the name, Hataro, written in Japanese and English. Diego said that he was a brilliant engineer who specialized in electromagnetism and various forms of a signal communication. It all made sense from a team standpoint except for the last member. He was a large, muscular man, and his name read Ao. I wasn't an idiot, and I recognized he was there to watch us for Sabanto. And Diego had already told me that Ao was a former JSDF Special Forces, and was considered one of the Sabanto Corps fixers, so to watch out and not trust him. Diego led the group downward with Ao in the back as the light receded the deeper that we went. Diving in the deep is a strange experience as one senses focus in the relative silence of the water. Your breathing, your heart rate, all can make one feel claustrophobic, as if the ocean itself was collapsing in and around you. That feeling didn't dissipate when we came to the cave entrance, about 30 meters down. The handheld and scuba-mounted light illuminated the entry. I took one last look at the light above and followed Diego in. The cavern had been big enough to fit the drone sub, so logically, I knew that we could all fit fine, but something about the tunnel felt restrictive, as if it were swallowing me. I've been underwater much of my life, and never had I felt so uneasy in a place. All of the team had underwater comms, and I heard a call from behind me, so I turned around. Dr. Yui was examining the side of the tunnel wall. Something wrong, doctor, I called out. A small buzz of static. This is not like any rock I've ever seen before. She rubbed a gloved hand over the side. It's not igneous or basalt like it should be. This is incredible. We need to keep moving. Diego called over the comms with a tinge of frustration in his voice. The five of us continued to swim through the passageway, and I caught myself staring at the walls after what Dr. Yui had said. There was something strange about them. They were dark in tone and there seemed to be almost organic lines that ran through them, though I reminded myself such things were not possible. And we swam for a good 10 minutes before coming to the alcove the drone sub had detected as Diego pushed forward with an uncharacteristic intensity. When I turned the corner, I was initially disappointed, as it was just a small area that looked like a dead end when I heard, holy crap, over the comms. And Diego was pointing upwards and I lit to see a water line and looked back. Is there air above here? I called out confused. Well, let's find out. And Diego swam upwards, with me following closely behind. We poked our heads out of the water with our lights, illuminating the pitch black. There shouldn't be an air pocket. I'm not sure how to describe this sanely. An air pocket only forms underwater when it can't be released, which means some level of air tightness which simply could not be in a stone structure. The rest of the team had now emerged from below and the look of surprise and shock was on all of our faces. There was a nearby ledge and Diego pulled himself up and out of the water, looking around. The collective silence was broke by Diego, 
taking off his mask and he shouted to stop. I'm not sure if I expected him to start gasping or fall over, but Diego took a deep breath and gave us a shrug. I can't believe I'm saying this, but it seems breathable. This isn't possible. Dr. Yui called out over the comms, and I found myself nodding in agreement. Even if it is, we need to go back. This is an incredible find. We need to get more equipment, sensors. Haturo spoke up for the first time. No. The cold tone of Ao spoke out. The signal needs to be investigated first. Yui and Atoro looked at each other before glancing at me and my reaction. I looked over at Diego, who was eye-locked with Ao before nodding sunnily. Yeah, let's see what we can find here first. As Diego pulled himself fully out of the water, a dark tunnel led away from the alcove and he gestured towards it. All right, enough with the BS. What aren't you telling us? I yelled at Diego and then stared at Ao, who made no reaction. How the heck can you not want to go back after that? Diego looked back to Ao for a second before sighing. Sabato Corp knew something was here. I lied when I said I've been looking all over the Pacific. I've only been looking here. This place is older than people realize, but only Sabato seems to think that there's something here. And what the heck is here then? Truly, I don't know. But Sabato Corp believes there is something primordial here. Something that could reshape the world. The company goes back longer than you can imagine and for whatever reason, believes that there is something here at this site it needs. I don't know anything beyond that really. I glanced over to Yui and Tartaro's look of confusion, and it confirmed that they didn't know anything either. Ao was positioned by where we had entered, and I didn't think anybody was getting past them. So what? Keep going or Ao here will take care of us. Ao swam forward and brought his face in front of mine. You will go forward and complete the task because that's what you're being paid for. These kinds of dives are so treacherous, sometimes accidents happen. I would have to have to report as such an occurrence. Please, Ao. Diego called out looking back to me. Please, we're on the cusp of discovery in something potentially amazing here. Just to focus on that. My anger had flared as I locked eyes with Ao, but resigned myself and looked back at Diego. You better not have just saved my life before just to kill me here. We eventually all got out of the water in the small alcove and took off our scuba gear. Nothing was planned for us not to be swimming so our wetsuits would have to do for exploration. The air was shockingly breathable, though the air had a putrid, sulfurous smell which caused my nostrils to flare. I wonder what is producing the air. I called out loud to no one in particular. Dr. Yui was kneeling, examining a wall. There's some kind of slime on these surfaces here. I'm not a biologist, but I wonder if it's what's responsible. Yui ran the slime between her fingers for a few moments, staring at the viscous ooze. She shook her head as if out of a trance. Come on, let's get going. Diego beckoned to the hallway of the alcove. Our flashlights barely penetrated the darkness ahead. The lights didn't seem to scatter off the walls and made illumination dim. If the swim earlier made me feel trapped and confined, this was exponentially worse. We came to a point where we had to squeeze through and after a large antechamber, it greeted us. It was cavernous which should have been crushed by the underwater pressure, but here it was. Multiple hallways branched off the room. As any illusion, this was a natural formation had vanished. This is unbelievable. I called out in amazement, my anger and anxiety temporarily forgotten. Carvings and markings on the wall caught my attention immediately. Diego, come look at this. Diego's flashlight joined mine. There were pictorial reliefs, but nothing that I had seen before. Carvings and glyphs all kept showing an image of some sort of amorphous creature 
with a circle over its head. And creatures appeared often in Sumerian and Egyptian hieroglyphics, but something about this image unsettled me. You see anything like this before? Diego leaned in closer and exhaled hard. Yes, well, sort of. There are similar reliefs that I've seen at various times at Sabanto Corp. What they mean, though, is beyond me, as they never let me study them. I was about to press Diego when Dr. Yui called out. Oh, where is Hituro? We all turned around in the cavern, as flashlights tried to illuminate every corner. Hituro! I called out to the darkness as Diego and Yui did the same to no response. Something about the rock didn't echo as I expected. Ayo, hey you're supposed to be keeping an eye on us. Did you see where Haturo went? Diego called out. No. He was right near me but wasn't when I turned around. Could he have gone down one of the halls here? Nothing seems to echo well here so maybe he just can't hear us. Dr. Yui's voice was noticeably panicked. All right, all right. Diego was murmuring to himself. I'll take Ao and go down this path. And Yui can go with you. He pointed towards me. In ten minutes, if you haven't found him, come right back here. Ao looked like he was going to object, but just nodded and followed Diego down the rightmost path. I tapped you in the shoulder and chose one of the paths on the left. It was as dark and winding as the one before, and I had lost a mental track of how big this place must have been. We wandered in silence until reaching a bend and a new room opened up to us. The thick slimy muck that Dr. Yui had pointed out earlier dripped all over the room, as the sulfurous smell almost made me vomit. At the center of the room was an elevated platform with more glyphs and symbols carved into it. I know I should have left, but the platform seemed to call out to me. What is this place? Yui spoke in Japanese with what I can only assume were curse words before switching back to English. I don't know, but we should go back and tell the others. But before she finished her sentence, we both leapt backwards at seeing what was at the top. The sprawled form of Haturo sat at the top covered in these slimy substance. We rushed over to see his eyes, locked open in horror, trying to free him. Yui and I pulled and tore at the goo holding him, only to find his stomach had been torn open, his organs being pulled out individually by these slime tendrils. The sight was finally too much and I vomited in disgust while Yui screamed. As I fell backwards, I found my right hand unable to move. I turned the flashlight over to see my hand had been trapped in the slime. With every ounce of strength, I managed to dislodge the grip while I screamed out, Run! Stumbling to my feet, we tried to make it down the hallway, but we tripped on the sticky slime substance several times. Each footstep was labored, as we rushed to get back to the main chamber as we both cried for help. Finally, the dark path came to an end, and the cavernous room greeted us. And Diego and Dayo turned their attention towards us, as we rushed over to them screaming, how Haturo was dead and the slime. We need to get the heck out of here now, I yelled. Yui was speaking Japanese to Ao in quick and loud tones while Diego put his hands on me. Calm down, just show us what you found. I pushed him away. No way, screw that and screw you. I'm not going back anywhere near that place. Diego looked at Ao, who was listening to Yui crying and pleading with him in Japanese. Well, are you going to do anything? Ao looked frightened, which was not what I would have expected from the man. We should get out of here, he called out coolly. The following silence was broken when I realized something with horror. Which way did we come in? I swear the tunnel that we came from isn't here anymore. Everyone looked around the room and down the hallways with their flashlights. Did no one mark the tunnel? No, I don't think this is a mark issue. The tunnel that we entered through isn't here anymore. Diego looked down the pathways as he spoke. Yui began trembling and murmuring in Japanese. We shouldn't have come here. There's no point in second guessing. We need to focus on getting out of here. 
Ayo gestured to one of the tunnels and made a mark on the side with a knife. We'll go one by one if we have to, but let's find a way out of here. Diego strode forward with Yui behind. I walked next, but I caught another glimpse of the pictures on the wall. The amorphous creature surrounding a sphere in my heart sank as I turned away and trotted forward. I had lost count of time. The dark halls all seemed to merge with one another. The sickly slime coated everything and where it was thickest, we got stuck. Each time was another few minutes of delay getting free. Each minute was a precious. One of the flashlights had already gone out and the light was dimmer on the rest. Sometimes we'd end up back in the cavernous room while others led to literal dead ends. The place was impossibly large with how much we walked, and it seemed to change shape. Or maybe it was just all in my mind as I frankly couldn't even tell anymore. Crap. Diego called out hitting his flashlight which had gone out. He threw it against the wall in anger as it shattered. How have we not found the tunnel that we came from yet? Yui had become almost comatose, just following whoever was in front. Under her breath, she kept referencing the slime and Taturo and needing to go to him. Ayo's previous calmness was fraying. We are running out of time before we get stuck in the blackness here. Yeah, no crap, but every time we make one of your marks, it is gone next time that we come to the corridors, even when we backtrack. Diego kicked his foot out of a slime patch. I tried to push Ayo and Diego away from each other when Yui spoke up unexpectedly. There's a voice ahead. All of this turned, and to my surprise, there was. Or at least it sounded like it. The four of us pushed forward through the tunnel when he came to the main cavernous area again. In the middle was Hachiro. His wetsuit was ripped and torn, but his body was fine. I stepped forward in shock. You, it can't be. I saw you ripped apart. Hachiro turned to me, his neck cocked to the side, just a bit too far than it should be normally. Come here. Yui began crying and speaking in Japanese as she ran towards him. Diego and I saw a trail of slime to him and called out to her to stop. But she was picked up by Ao and she continued to struggle in his arms, trying to get to Turo. Let me go. I have to get to him. She broke between English and Japanese. Atiro looked at Yui struggling in Ao's arms and started to walk towards them. Come to me. Ayo threw Yui down and ran at Arturo full speed, with a blazingly fast punch that should have floored him. But instead, Ayo's hand was lodged in his face. The same slime from before extracted itself around his arm, who struggled to get away but to no avail, while Diego and I looked on in horror. Ayo cried out in pain as the slime enveloped his arm and began to streak up his shoulder and onto his face. The oozy Naturo coiled around Ayo's neck and into his ears and then mouth and eyes. His wails were silenced and his body went limp. Yui sat on the ground watching the spectacle as the face of Aturo reformed itself and Ayo's body was taken by the ooze on the floor. Come to me. Join with me. As Aturo extended his hand. The hand began to extend longer and longer as it approached Yui, whose shock had taken over. As it reached her, it was knocked aside by Diego, who was grabbed instead. Run, he called out, the slime hand grasping him. I ran to Yui, who seemed transfixed, and used my body to throw her to her feet. We need to go now. As I pulled her by the hand down one of the hallways... I spared a glance back at Diego who was face to face with the Haturo creature. I should have kept running instead as the slime hand pushed its way through Diego and out the other side. Dragging Yui, I ran aimlessly down the dark hallway, hitting my head and shoulders trying to do anything to just move forward. I ran and I ran with no thought and suddenly I was in a free fall hitting water. My flashlight fell out of my hand and only Yui's remained. In the darkness, it took me a moment to realize that this was the water entry that we had come through. I looked around and saw our scuba equipment was now covered in the grotesque slime. Several had been punctured and I couldn't free the rest. 
There was one tank that looked in good enough shape. Come on, Yui. I think we can share this tank and get out of here. I looked up. Yui. She was standing face in the tunnel that we had come from. I can hear it. It tells me to come. Yui, come on. Whatever that thing is is coming. We need to go. It calls to me. It calls to all of us. She looked down at me before, racing off back into the darkness. I swore again and again as I hastily put on the tank and jumped into the water. There was only a small light in the scuba tank left as I swam through the dark tunnel. Forward and forward I swam as I looked at the O2 gauge. It was reading critical. I must have had a leak after all. When I thought the tunnel passage was confining before, the previous the organic lines I noticed on the walls were moving, writhing. As I swam forward, one of the walls grabbed onto me. I tried and tried to kick it off me, but I went no further. The gauge on my tank had moved to empty and I could feel lightheaded. I pulled the tank off and saw there was a tendril of slime holding onto me. I took the tank and I bashed at it again and again. As my breath was getting desperate, the slime grabbed onto the tank instead and freeing me. I saw the end of the tunnel to the open sea. My vision was getting foggy as I pushed forward. I pushed and pushed until everything went to blackness. The smell of a cigarette made me want to puke as the man across from me took another drag. So that's all you remember? Flicking his ash. And the next thing I remembered I was awake here on the Sabanto ship. You told me that you had found me floating in the water and then we came in here. The man stared at me before speaking Japanese to another person in the room. Thank you. This has been most helpful. Please, we have to get away from here. We need to make sure that whatever this thing is stays locked away. The man with the cigarette put it out as he got up. This Sabanto Corp is perfectly capable of handling the situation. You will be dropped off back on shore and your services are no longer needed. That's it. Four team members died and you're just done with this? The man sighed. Three... And Dr. Yui also returned. What are you talking about? After we found you, we also found Dr. Yui floating nearby. No, that's not possible. There were no more tanks left. The man shrugged. You can ask her yourself later. For now, just remain here until we can arrange a transport to shore. He and the other person left the room and closed the door behind them. I watched them from the porthole in the door go down the hallway. I watched as the figure of Dr. Yui stopped to speak with them. I watched as Dr. Yui looked back down the hall at me. I watched as her head was caught just a bit too far, and a tinge of slime was on her lips. The emergency alert system warned us of an incoming severe storm. Written by T.J. Lee The system alert tone woke me from a deep sleep. It was late and the power was cut from the house, likely due to the bitter winds raging outside. Nothing new in this part of the world, I suppose, but it didn't make it any less jarring to wake from. Stumbling out of bed and grabbing a torch to help light the way, my brother was already downstairs and making provisions to take with us into the basement. We owned the property together and we got on pretty well since we were close in age. Our parents had died young so we looked out for one another. He was the big brother that screwed up and got caught. I was the little brother that screwed up and got away with it by learning from him. Brandon, how long have you been up? How's the storm outside? You grabbing anything good? I sleepily asked as I took a seat in the cold kitchen. I still glazed from tiredness. Two hours, it's pretty bad. I'm always making something good. He chirped. Back hunched over in front of me as he busied himself in the fridge before moving to the cabinets. We've got about 20 minutes at best. I'm glad you got your butt up or I was going to open the window on you. I smirked. He was always so adept at diffusing a scary situation, 
even when we were kids. I guess that's the supportive big brother for you. I helped with packing and we headed down to the basement with a few minutes to spare. Thankfully, with storms being a common occurrence around here, it was in a totally unexpected situation. We set up the generator and got comfortable on the fold-out beds, him listening to some music and me playing on the switch. How bad did they say the storm was going to be? They didn't. The broadcast just said a storm was rolling in and that we had to take shelter until the morning. It was kind of weird, but whatever. I'm not a scientist. Meteorologist Mike. They're the weather experts. Yeah, yeah, whatever, nerd. We chuckled and the sound of the wind outside brought a nice bit of ambience with it, leading to a calmness as we settled in. Eventually, I started feeling tired again and decided a nap was the best thing to pass the time. Letting myself get relaxed and hoping the storm wasn't too bad. It wouldn't be long before Brandon woke me, his eyes wide and full of fear. Mike, there's something wrong. Seriously wrong. What's up? You ran out of snacks. No, dude, listen. What a... Shh. He put a finger to my lips and we listened. The ambient sounds of the basement were the only things that my ears could pick up. I don't hear anything. Exactly. Where the heck is the storm? It's supposed to be passing overhead. We shouldn't even be in the eye. Why is there no rain, no wind, no debris rattling around? He looked around nervously, staring at the doors leading up and outside to the yard. I want to go to the windows and check first, but I'm going to go outside. I think something is going on. Go outside in a freaking storm? Are you serious? You're asking for it, dude. I sat up and got out of bed, walking with him as he made a beeline for the top windows, standing on a pair of stacked crates to get a better view. I get that you're worried, but we have no idea what's out there. You can't just venture out like that. He didn't respond as he leaned up and craned his head out the window, using his hands like binoculars to get a better view out of the clouded pane. Silence fell over the room for a few moments, before I made a sound like a gasp caught in his chest, his shoulders shaking as he stumbled back and crawled on his hands and feet backwards to the wall, staring at the top of the window with absolute terror etched over his face. Dude, what's up? Is it coming towards us? I took a single step towards the mirror and he screamed, No! at the top of his lungs, the sound bouncing off the small basement and adding more weight to his command. Again, I looked at him, and the eyes did not leave the window. Mike, don't go outside. I think there might be a gas leak or something because... He picked at his fingers as his legs shook uncontrollably. There's no way I just saw what I think I saw. We stood there for a few moments in total silence, until the sound of my phone's automatic alert blasted through the room and shook us both up. This is Minosha County. Residents are advised that the storm has now passed. You can go outside. Go outside. Go outside. Go outside. Weird freaking transmission, eh? I tried to break the ice, but the longer that it went on, the more uncomfortable the situation became. It repeated incessantly like a command that distorted as it looped further, Brandon grabbing at his hair as he buried his face into his knees. No, it's not safe. It's not safe, Mike. Uh, I'm sure it's just a glitch, and if you think that we do have a gas leak, surely we should go out. I walked over and put a hand on his shoulder. We can't stay in here forever, right? He shook his head and kept his face buried in his knees, muttering to himself. Go and look out the window, Brandon. If, if there's nothing there, we can go out. I need to know that I'm not crazy. 
He sniffed and emotion rocked his voice. I wasn't used to seeing him like this. Dude is a jacked engineer and he keeps his emotions to himself. Please, bro. Alright, you got it. I squeezed his shoulder reassuringly and made my way towards the boxes, stood up and gazed outside. It was sunset. The street lamps had begun steadily illuminating the edges of the cul-de-sac that we lived on. Ours was placed perfectly in the center, so we had a good view of both the neighboring houses on either side that met in the dead end of the street and a row of houses that trailed off southwards. There were a couple of cars left parked in unusual places, as if they had been left there in a hurry. But that's to be expected with a storm warning, I suppose. Some groceries and boxes dropped and left where they had landed. A couple of doors off the hinges and some windows were smashed. Again, unsettling, but nothing that you wouldn't expect post-storm. I felt a bit more at ease and I turned back to Brandon, smiling. Hey, it's all good, buddy. Some light damage, but nothing to worry about. We can go outside. He lifted his head, eyes reddened from tears and his lip trembling. This wasn't like him. And whatever he had seen, it truly rocked the foundations of his world. But he looked hopeful as his gaze met mine a smile creeping its way up the contours of his face before falling so very far into a horrified grimace as he caught sight of something in the window, screaming and covering his eyes again. I didn't want to turn around. The overwhelming presence of something sinister filling my body with unspeakable dread. Even more so when I heard the single word escape Brandon's lips between pain-wracked sobs and an ensuing panic attack. Mom. Our parents had perished in a house fire many years ago when we were kids. Brandon, being the older sibling and awake the night of the blaze, had swaddled me in thick blankets, grabbing my badly conscious body from the smoke-filled room and carried me outside. He had purposely kept my face hidden as he ran headfirst through the flames and risked burning himself in the process. I was only 10 and he was 15. Our parents never made it, dying in their bedrooms from smoke inhalation. That's what I was told. In the years that followed, Brandon would always tell me that he hid my face at the flames that wouldn't risk singeing my skin. But as I would come to discover, that wasn't the case. I turned and saw our mother's face peering in from the other side of the window. Eyes melting in the sockets and running down her cheeks like a waterfall of milky flesh. Her lips stripped away and showcasing blackened teeth that oozed a bile from her gums and tongue. Every inch of her body was practically vibrating as she looked in, inching closer and closer with a manic stare in her eyes until she was pressing her burnt, bloodied and decaying flesh against the window with a sickening squelch. I felt sick, my body tensed up, and it was as if I was staring down a bear in the woods. I could do nothing but stand there, utterly frozen. From behind me, I hear Brandon just sobbing into his knees and something in his words aroused my body from the fear. I'm sorry, mom. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. Bang. Her head thumped against the window with a sickening crunch as the sun set ominously behind her, hissing something imperceptible to me, but clear as day to Brandon. I backed off and sat by the wall as we watched this creature wearing our mother's skin smack its head into the window three more times before it slinking backwards and out of sight. A bloodied smear on the window pane was all that remained. No sooner had she left did the wind pick up, bitter and bilious as it smashed against the house, fiercer than ever before. I don't know how long we sat there before, I worked up the courage to ask him why he was sorry, 
but he must have known that I was waiting because he didn't hesitate to admit what he had done. Brandon had been a problem child. Maybe it was being the oldest with less attention on him. Maybe it was our dad's drinking. But he acted out in various ways. If it wasn't bullying the kids at school or vandalizing property, it was something else. I was so much younger that I didn't fully understand how bad it was. But there was an ultimatum given by my parents. Another slip up and they would kick him out. Evidently, being a teenager and full of rage, he'd turn to unhealthy outlets to handle those emotions. In this case, arson. I was just trying to let off a little steam, you know. Set a small fire with one of Dad's shirts in the yard. Used some gasoline and I sat there watching it. I don't know how it got out of control, but it did. Before I knew it, it had caught onto the side of the house and I had no way of stopping it. As I creeped up to the upper floors where Mom and Dad were, or where you were, his eyes are full of shame and a wariness that aged him horribly. I ran up to the room first, but he shook his head. The words I caught in his throat. Dad was already gone, dead in the bed from a smoke inhalation. And so I ran for you, and grateful that you had not suffered as much damage, packing you in blankets and running downstairs. He got up and wiped his face, taking a deep breath. A thunderclap rattled outside, and I looked to the window for just a moment. The barely lit streets providing any real information save for some shadows moving around. I chalked it up to debris and hoped to God it wasn't that thing slinking around. Talking was all that I could do to keep my mind occupied, so I probed further. But there was something else that wasn't there. I lifted him and he faced towards the main doors that led up into the yard. The cogs in his mind turning as he took another breath before nodding slowly. Yeah, mom was crawling through the flames. Her body was scorched and she was screaming with every pained movement to reach me. Grabbing onto my ankle for dear life as she stared up. Looking exactly the same as the creature that we saw at the window. Milky eyes, blackened teeth. It was horrific. I couldn't do anything for her, Mike. You have to understand that. The rain started falling hard in the house. The onslaught of noises raising my own blood to a boil. So what? You just left her there? Our own mother? You made a mistake and didn't even attempt to correct it. What if we could have saved her, Brandon? What were you thinking? I felt my voice raise both in the face of the storm's intensity and in my own grief. This was someone that I had trusted and to this day thought had saved me from a tragic accident. I felt betrayed. I was thinking of you. Your life. Your future. Dad was gone and mom. What kind of life would she have? A burn victim confined to a freaking bed for the rest of her life. He began shouting back too, emotions overcoming him. You don't get to decide things like that, Brandon. This isn't your choice to make. That's our mother and that's her life. How could you? The wind swept up and smashed against the doors to the basement, rattling the hinges as I squared up to my bigger brother. Despite the obvious shame, he didn't back down. What would you have preferred? I save her and not you. Get real, Mike. The banging increased. At any moment, those hinges could come loose. I would have preferred that you died with them. I screamed before a volley and a punch right for his jaw and sending him hurtling to the ground in a heap. The argument ended when the doors finally gave way and the bitter cold ripped through the basement, bringing with it the horrific scent of burnt flesh and a terrible cacophony of screams in the wind as if dragged from the very lungs of our long-dead mother. The assault in the sense was almost too much as both of us ran to grab the doors and pull them shut. I caught sight of the storm on the horizon, black and red winds so thick that they caught in the light of the few lamps left standing and flashed brilliantly in the limelight. 
Walking among these stinging gales was the desiccated corpse of her mother, singed a dress and blackened skin, giving her no movement restrictions as she swayed under the nearest lamplight. Observing us from a distance, with an arm outstretched and a broken finger beckoning. She was waiting. I wrestled with the door as hard as I could, but the storm would not relent. I looked over to Brandon and saw him lock eyes with that thing, and tears flooded his eyes, and he shouted over the storm to me. I think I need to go with her. I don't think it's going to stop until I do. What? No, that's crazy. We don't know what's going on out there. You can't just go out there and give yourself to that monster. He paused and stares for a moment, seemingly making his mind up as he releases his grip on the door handle. That's no monster. That's our mom. And she's come to make sure that I repay the debt that I owe. I love you, little brother. Stay indoors. And with that, he lunged up the stairs and braced himself against the evil wind that ripped and tore at his body. With every step that he took, another yelp of pain. I could do nothing but watch as he trapezed down the path of agony towards mom's open and foreboding arms. In the few moments before a powerful gust of wind knocked me back against the wall and the world faded to black, I saw the shape that was our mother writhe and undulate, giving way for something so horrifying that I can't bring myself to put it to paper. But I could hear Brandon's voice carry on the wind, one final time before it all went dark. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. I awoke the next day to a clear sky and a concerned neighbor peering in from the top of the stairs. The door had been ripped off its hinges and destruction had torn through the house. I didn't have the heart to tell him what had happened, so I lied. Yeah, the storm hit us really hard last night and I smashed my head. I should have safeguarded the house better, I guess. I chuckled and rubbed my noggin, my neighbor looking at me puzzled. What storm? It was fine last night. Clear skies and a cool breeze. Did you have a rowdy party? It sure as heck looks like it. Maybe it was that brother of yours. He ranted on about my brother's habits. The way he always seemed like he was high and so forth. But I barely registered it as reality set in for me. And I stared past him to the street where my mom had stood. Where Brandon had walked to. And left myself with one burning question that will haunt me for the rest of my days. Oh, what the heck had we seen last night? If you drive to Texas, don't do it at night. Written by Kessel the Viking. A week or so ago, I was driving down to Texas. It was a long drive. One that would take two days unless I drove non-stop throughout the night. However, I was eager to reach my destination and chose to tough it out for the sake of getting there sooner. The drive started out relatively normal. I drove for a couple of hours south and I felt good. I had my music cranked in a cooler full of energy drinks in the passenger seat. When I saw the sign saying, now entering Tennessee, I thought that I was making record time. I must have forgotten to watch the clock though, because the sun began to set. I was partially confused, mainly due to the fact that I had left earlier in the day. But I disregarded it as the idle distractions that I had created for myself to pass the time, faster being the cause. Something else odd I noticed was the open freeway. Normally, I would expect to see many vehicles all traveling to different places, but instead, I seemed to be the only one out and about. Still, I wasn't feeling tired and I'd already committed to driving straight through the night, even if things seemed strange. But as I drove on, 
I realized that the sun had set far too quickly, and with the lack of other vehicles on the road, it looked like I was driving in a void. The blackened world around me was only illuminated by my high beams, but I could only see perhaps 15 feet ahead of me. There were a few normalities like guardrails and mile markers, but if something were to appear in front of me, I would likely hit it because of my lack of visibility. So I pulled over. My vehicle came to a subtle halt on the side of the freeway as I turned on my emergency lights. Realistically, I knew that it wasn't a fog. It was just dark. Darker than the world behind my eyelids. I suppose that I wanted to see another car pass by before I concluded that something had gone wrong. But none came. I waited for more than 20 minutes and not one car or truck barreled down the freeway. I decided to roll my window down and allow some fresh air into my car. Plus, I was slightly panicking because I did have somewhere to be and this was taking up a precious time. Suddenly, the engine shut off. Even the accessory power had gone cold. I performed some percussive maintenance by smacking my hand against the dash, as if it would magically fix everything, but it obviously didn't. And then I heard a quiet, ticking sound. You know the sound your fingers make when you tap them against a the table? It was like that. But instead of the soft, fleshy contact you would get from the skin of your digits, it was more like the clicking of nails against plastic. My intuition told me that it was coming from under the hood, and therefore I would have to step outside. But just as I was about to open the door, I almost had a heart attack because, hanging over the trim of the window seal, was a hand. I freaked out and flung myself into the passenger seat on top of my cooler. The hand was tapping its pale white fingers against the inner part of my door. And after my initial fear had died down, I thought that it may have been someone looking to help me. Foolish, I know, but I did have my four ways on. A part of me knew full well that another vehicle hadn't pulled up behind mine while I was distracted by the engine malfunction, but I still inquired. Hello? Who's there? The finger stopped moving and the hand slipped down slowly over the side of the door and out of sight. I waited while trying to catch my breath before asking again. Hey, who's there? Why are you messing with me? No sound. Not even crickets responded to me. I turned my head to peer out of the rear window and I couldn't see anything which made me wonder more as to who was outside of my car. My ear was pressed against the passenger window, and just as I was about to slide back into the driver's seat, I heard the tapping a second time right next to my ear. I nearly got whiplash from the speed at which I turned my head to look out the window. There wasn't anything there, in terms of a tapping hand, however. There were fingerprints left in the condensation on the outside of the glass. My heart raced and I crawled back into the driver's seat and tried to stupidly roll the window up even though I quickly realized that it was futile. And then I started to hear footsteps in the gravel on the side of the asphalt, but when I looked in my mirror I saw nothing. That was until my headlights came on without warning. They flashed brightly ahead of me and illuminated the figure of a human standing directly in the light but I couldn't see who it was because they were missing their head. The headless torso held out its thumb as if it were hitchhiking. However, it only did it for a moment before beginning to approach my vehicle. I tried to start the engine, but for some reason my key wouldn't crank. And then I thought, if the headlights are on, then surely I should be able to at least roll the window up. It moved slowly, the body that is, towards me with a shambling, unstable gait. Unfortunately for me, my window wouldn't go up, 
even when fiddling with the key in the ignition. I started to panic and sweat began forming on the palms of my hands. By the time it was at the front corner of the driver's side, I decided that I would get out and confront it. As I reached for the door handle and pulled, I found that it wouldn't open. I have one of those stupid pull-up locks that sink into the door, so I wasn't able to grip it and force it up. The electronic unlock didn't work either, so my only option was to climb out of the window. The problem was, it had already reached my side mirror. There was no way I would be able to crawl through the window without that thing grabbing me. So once again, I slid into the passenger seat, with my feet poised to kick if it tried to worm its unnatural way inside. From there, I could see it was a masculine body that was exceedingly tall and it wore a gray sweatshirt laden with holes. It had scuffed pants with tread marks denoting a tire had crossed over them at a ludicrous speed. If I had to guess, I would say that they had been run over. As it tried to reach its arm inside, I kicked it away. It didn't appear to have much more than primal instinct, because it stumbled back and took some time to regain itself. Still, regardless of the fact that it was a brainless walking corpse, I was still terrified. When it reached inside the second time, I scooted myself towards the driver's seat and forcibly jammed my foot against its chest, sending it falling to the ground. I used the opportunity to get out of the car via the open window and run around to the trunk. I couldn't open it without the key which I had stupidly left inside, but at least I could get away. But as it rose to its feet, I felt an immense pressure in my head, as if somebody were squeezing my brain. My vision became blurry and different parts of my body burned with a fiery intensity. Every time that I tried to move one of my limbs, I couldn't and the paralysis weaving its way through my body made me an easy target. The headless torso continued shuffling its disjointed feet in my direction with an outstretched hand, but the other was held low with its thumb out. Suddenly, my faculties snapped back into my control and I was able to avoid its mindless descent by stepping to the other side of my vehicle. I don't know what made me think the car would start if I tried again, but despite my former failures, I awkwardly jumped inside and turned the key. My eyes widened with joy when the engine turned over and followed by the familiar rumbling of the vehicle running. I threw the shifter into drive and slammed my foot on the gas without hesitation, and I sped off into the dark. I thought that I was in the clear, and my breathing slowly returned to normal. It was odd that some strange part of me thought that maybe it was just a ghost that was asking for help. But that was highly improbable, and now I know that wasn't the case. The freeway was still obscured by the all-encompassing darkness, but I didn't care. I just kept on driving. And then my heart skipped a beat, because standing on the side of the road was the headless person. I drove by but couldn't see them in my rearview mirror due to the darkness. I took a breath and I drove on, without trying to think about it too much while taking a look at my clock to see what time it was. It read, Midnight. Great, I said aloud, still maintaining a relatively high speed. My hands were firmly gripping the steering wheel and I kept thinking that it was over but I was wrong again. Like before, I saw the body standing adjacent to the freeway with an outstretched thumb. It started walking into the road as if it were trying to be hit. I avoided it and continued on, completely freaked out. I took a peek in my rearview mirror and I could have sworn it was sitting in my back seat, but as I quickly glanced over my shoulder, it was only an empty seat. My paranoia was somewhat satiated when I saw it again. 
but now I was holding something in the hand that didn't have its thumb out. As I drove by, I narrowed my eyes to see it closer. It was holding a smiling head. At this point, I was close to fainting from the fear. I just wanted this horror loop to end, but as that thought crossed my mind, I heard something heavy fall onto the roof of my car. I jumped in my seat, startled by the sound, and I looked up. Obviously, I couldn't see anything, but I could hear movement and I could sense the weight lurking above. Regrettably, during all the chaos, I had still forgotten to roll the window up, which I admit was entirely my fault, much to my dismay. I say that because the sound suddenly stopped and I thought that it was over once again. But when I looked to my left, I was met face to face with the severed head. The body was on the roof, holding the head in my open window. I yelled and it tossed the head inside and it latched onto my thigh, butting deeply into my muscle. It laughed maniacally and I nearly crashed, trying to deal with both the head and keeping my vehicle on the road. I yelled out in pain and began pounding my fist against the back of the head. Luckily, one of my attacks dislodged it from my leg, and I grabbed onto it with my free hand before throwing it out the window. All at once, the darkness lifted, and I was able to see the head bouncing down the freeway in my mirror, followed by the body that it belonged to sliding off my roof only to tumble to the road. I was breathing so hard that I thought I might lose consciousness and my leg was bleeding pretty badly, but I dared not stop. I started to see other vehicles, and that's when I finally allowed myself to feel any sort of relief. The events that I had experienced shocked my system, and I decided that I would pull off at the nearest town and get a motel for the rest of the night. When I found one, the lady at the counter said, Your face is so pale. Are you okay? I looked deeply into her eyes and said, There is a man, or rather, a body on the freeway, without a head. It terrorized me and it nearly killed me. She stared at me for a moment before bursting into laughter. Oh, you young people. You always have the craziest stories. Although, I do seem to remember someone out saying something about a body on the freeway once. My eyes lit up. What? What did they say? What happened to them? Well, nothing happened. We called the police, but they found no bodies, nor did they find any evidence of an accident. The person ended up leaving the next morning, and that was that. Huh. I uttered softly. I got a room for the night, and I addressed my wound. It wasn't as bad as I had originally thought. It had to have been the lighting that made it look worse. I stayed until around early morning and then I checked out with barely any sleep. Now, I'm telling you to avoid driving down any freeway if you're going to Texas. I mean, I can't say for sure what the catalyst is, but something to do with my specific trip caused me to experience this horrific anomaly and I just want to warn everyone that I can. Although the lady at the counter did say that someone else had experienced something similar, I just don't know, and it's better to be safe than sorry. What's even worse is that when I was about to get into my car to continue my drive south, I noticed a fresh handprint pressed firmly against the outside of my driver's side window. I guess I'll be sticking to day driving from now on. Someone posted a classified image they found on the deep web, written by South Park is Cool. The internet is a big place. Some parts of the internet are funny, other parts of the internet are more serious. But certain parts of the internet are quite scary. Sometimes you don't even know what you're getting into. A random link can take you to somewhere funny or to somewhere creepy. You can't trust every link. 
Do not attempt to track down the source of every weird image that you come across either. While browsing through my favorite subreddits one evening, I remembered a certain post that I read once that I had found interesting. It was a post about a leaked image that was possibly a classified image that no one was supposed to see. I typed the title of the post as I had remembered it into the search bar. I added quotations to narrow down the search. I looked through the results for about half an hour. I couldn't find the post. At one point, I found what I thought was the post, based on the title being a near match. I found this image on the dark web. It was taken by a government screenshot. I clicked on the post, hoping that it was what I was looking for. It wasn't. It was a screenshot of an image of a squirrel with two dozen long, sharp claws and a mouth that took up most of its head. It had no jaw, just extra teeth. There were random numbers and letters at the top and at the bottom of the image. I didn't know what they meant, however, and I don't remember the exact sequences either. I found it interesting, though. At first, I thought it was an image that someone had edited with Photoshop. One minute into looking at it, I noticed that there was something real about it. It didn't look like a creepypasta edit or a CGI animation. It was lifelike with a lot of realistic details. I started to get chills as I looked at it, so I scrolled down to read the comments. There were three. This is probably fake. Where is that from? Probably just a leaked image from an up-and-coming movie. I didn't want to scroll back up. The image was a muscle tightening level of scary. The people who make creepy video thumbnails would do anything to make edits that are as realistic and as scary as that image. I dreaded at the thought of looking at it again. I was, however, curious if there were any new comments, so I refreshed the page. After refreshing, all three of the comments had been removed. I scrolled up a bit. Noticing that the post itself had been removed as well. I was surprised, but then I noticed the post was made only five minutes earlier. While the image of the squirrel was terrifying, I was interested in its source. It looked too real to be fake, and there's no way that it was only photoshopped. That was all despite the fact that it didn't even look like it was of this world. I wanted to find out where it had originated from. Whether it was real or not too, in case it was somehow not real. I felt like I had looked at something that I wasn't supposed to see. Something classified. Something that is being kept secret by the government. Something only I and a few internet strangers may have seen. I was already 21 years old, but I still had some spare time on my hands. Enough time to search for whatever it was that I saw. I downloaded a VPN and did some research about the deep web. I downloaded the Tor browser and then I began to dig through the hidden wiki. I knew that it was likely filled with a bunch of FBI agents but I wasn't looking for anything illegal. As long as I didn't click on a bad link I'd be fine, I thought to myself. Of course, I did tremble at the idea of clicking on a link that I didn't know was bad. I looked through the deep web for weeks trying to find a trace of the demonic squirrel, but there were none. I did multiple puzzles in case any of them would lead to at least a trace of it. I didn't know how to complete most of the puzzles, but there were tips on the internet that helped me complete more of the puzzles than I could have otherwise. About a month in, I stumbled across a puzzle that was just 20 circles with weird symbols in between them. There is a timer that counted down from 18, I was supposed to solve the problem in under 18 minutes. After doing all those other puzzles and riddles, I felt like it was easier to do this one. It was especially easy as it was very similar to some of the other ones that I had already done. I solved it when the timer was only 10 seconds away from hitting zero. When I solved it, I was taken to a blank black screen. A couple seconds later, Black silhouettes started dancing all over the screen. It was hypnotizing. 
but then it started to remind me of crawling bugs, which gave me a chill down my spine. The silhouettes crawled all over the screen. I watched it for a while until I noticed that there was something in the middle of the screen. Very faint numbers. I typed the numbers on my keyboard. I typed each number in the order that they were in on the screen. After doing so, the screen went black again. One minute later, the screen turned to magenta, but it was still blank, however. I waited for something to pop up, but nothing did. Even after half an hour, nothing popped up, and the screen didn't change at all. That couldn't have been it, though, I thought. I set the laptop aside for a few hours, and then I checked back, and the screen was still blank. I left it alone for a day, and then checked back. Still blank. I decided to just forget about it. If anything was going to pop up, it would take a while. Three and a half days later, I turned the screen back on, and the page had finally changed. There is a message in the middle of the screen. The true extent to existence is documented here. There is a link under the message, and of course I clicked it. After I clicked it, the link along with the message both disappeared. The screen turned orange, and dozens of links popped up all over the orange page. They were labeled with vague titles, stuff like, Lucy Leaves and You're Late. I clicked on the first one, it was titled, What Kind of Fish Is This? It was a video taken inside of a submarine. The camera was put up against a window. The sea was dark and nothing could be seen. But then it got darker. A dark silhouette had popped up. It took a second for me to realize that it was getting closer to the window. By the time that I realized it, a dark gray squirmy mass pushed itself up against the window. The camera shook, and I shook too. An eye opened up. It was red with a green triangular pupil in the middle. Alarms started going off within the submarine, and the video ended seconds later. I shivered. And whatever that was, all I knew was that it was creepy. I went back to the page with all the links on it. I was hoping the page that I was on was the only creepy one on the site. And my hopes were crushed when I clicked on the next link. It was titled, Look Across the Ocean. It was a video of the ocean taken from a boat. There were barely any waves out in the ocean. There is a fog in the distance, and other than that... I didn't know what I was supposed to see. I was confused, but then my question was answered. A colossal silhouette formed within the fog. I felt a wave of dread. The thing, whatever it was, was massive. The fog took up a lot of the sky. That thing took up a lot of the fog. I clicked back to the page filled with links. The next one was titled, Good Year. An image of two people sitting on a bench. They had eyes bigger than normal eyes and long fingers. Everything around them looked normal, but unfamiliar at the same time. The image had an exact date on it. May 23rd, 4037. Out of morbid curiosity, along with my eagerness to find out which one of the links included the source of the squirrel image, I kept looking through the links for a couple more hours. Some of the things I saw on there were more disturbing, while some of the other stuff I saw was at least a little bit interesting. There were videos of science experiments gone wrong, like a very graphic one called Goodbye Sly. There were images of New York City from different alternate realities, and classified documents about movies and songs that were mysteriously forgotten about and then covered up for some time, because some kind of dangerous entities were connected to them. Chilling videos of a squid-like creature in a containment room. And a document from an alternate reality that was found in a church in Wisconsin, which detailed an event called The War Against Satan's Titans, a 10-day incident that resulted in 100 million deaths worldwide. I spent two hours clicking on random links. I learned to ignore the ones that had Goodbye, Bye, and Leave in the title, when I began to get tired, I decided that I had seen enough. 
Most of the stuff on there was a downright creepy anyway. I closed everything and then I went to sleep. When I woke up in the morning, I checked my phone and I had gotten an email. It was titled, Click. The name attached to the message was a common one. It seemed like a normal message at first, but then I opened it. When I read the full message, I realized that I had already seen it. It was just that one word, click. I was confused. Who would send me an email with one word in it to start a thread? It had to be a bot or something, I thought. I closed it without much thought right afterwards. One minute after I had closed it, I got into the message from the same person. Go outside. I was still confused, but I was still under the impression that it was a bot, so I ignored the message as well. Throughout that day, I thought about all the stuff that I saw on the deep web the previous one. Again, some of it was interesting, but some of it was terrifying. I got chills just thinking about it. I didn't feel like going back to that site at all. And also, I knew that I could get into trouble for looking at classified information. So I really wasn't planning on going back anytime soon. But that's when a thought occurred to me. The messages from that morning were bot-like. But what if they weren't? I wondered. It was only a thought, though. I decided to wait until something else happened before. I made the assumption that the messages were from someone who knew I looked at those things on the deep web. At 4.55pm that day, I got a third message. Was it the squirrel? Assuming these messages didn't have to do with me, I chose not to assume the sender was talking about the squirrel that I saw the previous day. The message was vague, but it was close to confirming my idea that I was caught looking at all that classified stuff. But I needed a clear message to understand what this person was trying to tell me. As I was thinking... I got a fourth message from them. You solved the puzzle, then what? My heart sank. I was being stalked, great, I shouldn't have clicked into anything. But it was too late for that, wasn't it? I thought to myself about this. I decided not to go outside for a bit until at least a week after I had received that question. I avoided answering it at all, too. I wasn't going to let it get to me. The next day, completely forgetting about what I had planned before, I went outside for a walk. I was dumb for forgetting the message from just a week earlier telling me to go outside. Halfway through the walk, I noticed a dark gray car with tinted windows and it was parked down the road. I didn't think much of it at first, but later on, during a trip to the convenience store, as I was walking out of the store... I saw a similar looking gray car parked right outside in the parking lot. I avoided looking in the direction of it. After I got back home, I peeked out of the living room window for a minute. Another very similar gray car with tinted windows had passed by. I didn't want to think that it was the same car, but I couldn't shake the hunch. I felt dread at the thought of being in trouble with the government. Those were probably just three different, similar-looking cars, I thought. I hoped. But even then, what would that mean? I had wondered. Was there a convention of some sort? I wanted to think that I was just irrationally applying stuff to myself. But the patterns were getting too strong. I felt a tight sensation and I wanted out. I went into my room to delete the VPN and I deleted it and backed everything up and did a factory reset. It was all they could think of at that moment. After about a week, I got a knock on my door. It was a man in a dark blue suit. He had the standard government agent look, except his suit was more blue than black. I felt a sinking feeling after I saw him. It was time for me to be interrogated, I thought. I let the agent in. We both sat down on the couch over in the living room. We've been informed of a visit that you made to a website on the dark web, a site that we didn't know existed. What do you know about it? The agent asked. I accessed it by doing a puzzle. We know about the puzzle already. What do you know about the videos and images on the site? Uh, they were creepy. There was one of a weird fish under the sea, and another one of a big object or a creature, and the fog out in the ocean, I said. 
I was sweating. But I knew if that I answered all the questions with what I knew was true, that I would be off the hook. I then mentioned the stuff about cover-ups and pictures from alternate realities. I don't know how much of those things are real though, I said. The agent kept a straight face. We're going to have to investigate the devices that you have in this house. We won't take any of them, we just want to see them, the agent had asked. I gave them my laptop and I told the agent that I had reset it because of all the creepy stuff. The agent set the laptop down on the kitchen table. They opened up Tor and they looked through my gallery, investigating it thoroughly. I didn't think they would find anything very fishy on there though. They checked my phone next. After moments of looking through it, the agent handed it back to me. He decided that there was inconclusive evidence and that he was on his way out. Alright, that will be all. It's best not to visit that website again. You can end up seeing something that'll bother you for a lifetime. You'll also end up being interrogated, and your life will be very different when you're with us, the agent said. I understand, sir, I replied. His last two sentences gave me chills. I didn't want to know how an interrogation would go down for me. Hopefully it wouldn't be as bad as I've heard it has been in the States. As I began to worry about my future a bit more, the agent left my house. He shut the door behind him on his way out and I was relieved. That had to have been it, I thought. A few days later, I went grocery shopping and as I was walking out of the store, I spotted the same dark gray car with tinted windows that had been following me days before. It was parked near the front row of the cars to my right. I felt a dreadful tightness again. I thought that was it, I thought. I was confused. They didn't find anything on my devices, so why did they want to keep watching me? I wondered. I told myself that it was a coincidence, in order to ease my anxiety. However, I then saw a man get into the dark gray car. It was the agent who had questioned me. He was wearing casual clothing, but the face had matched. I knew that it was him for sure. Hopefully he'll stop following me soon, I thought. Whatever I stumbled across definitely had put me on a list. After I got home, I distracted myself by focusing on my usual interests, stuff on my laptop, and that was when I heard a knock on my window. I jumped. What was that, I wondered. I went up to the window, and with confusion I looked out of it. A person in a black hoodie was standing in my backyard, and they were looking up into my window. It was unnerving to see this random person in my backyard looking at me. I knew they wanted something though. As I made eye contact with them, they pointed towards the table right under the window. There was a note on it along with a phone sitting beside the note. I couldn't read the note from my window, but I realized the person in the hoodie wanted me to go out there to read it instead of bringing it right up to me. I decided to open the window so I could ask them what they had wanted, but they ran out of my backyard before I ever began to open the window. I walked into the living room to try to catch this person out the window, but after a couple of seconds of waiting, I saw the person speed walk down my driveway and then pass my house. I walked out my front door. What was it going to be, I wondered. I almost didn't care about the chilly late winter weather as I walked around back to my backyard, filled with curiosity again. I ran up to the table. The note on the table was being held down by a rock and I leaned in to read it. None of what you saw on that site was from this reality. Watch the video on the phone. Dispose of this note in the phone afterwards. They're watching you. I went right back into my room with the phone and the note. I don't know if the phone is a trick or not, but I've already gotten so deep into this thing so I probably can't back out. I have to watch the video on the phone. I dread what could happen next. I could end up being tortured if I don't watch the video, or I could end up being tortured if I watch it. Those are my main worries. Even if they're just ideas that I came up with in my head, they're quite conflicting. I'm frozen and thought about it. I don't know what to do, but I have to figure this out. It was an older smartphone, likely one from 2013. I turned it on and then opened the gallery app. I was nervous, wondering what I was about to find. There was only one video in the app, 
nothing out. I selected it. A woman with blonde hair was sitting on a bench up against the wall. She looked to be around my age, 21 or so. She began to speak with light urgency. Hello. You might be wondering who I am. I won't be telling you that information so I can remain anonymous. But what I will tell you is that the agents who are following you aren't trolling or pranking you. They are from an organization that is deep within the government. I can't and won't give you any names as I don't want to be in even more trouble if I get caught. The reason that I'm making you watch this is because the organization that is tracking you have been having trouble with the fact that things from alternate realities keep leaking into this one. They've been good at keeping these things under wraps, hidden from public knowledge, but they wanted to take the extra step in making sure nothing classified gets onto the internet. Recently, there was a big leak of info on a secluded deep website, a site that you may have visited recently, a site that you visited, and now government agents are watching you. This was a confusing video. That secluded deep website that she mentioned was definitely the one that I was looking at stuff on. And yes, the agents were watching me because I looked at the stuff on there. But who was this person and how did they know all of this? I wondered. As she continued to speak, her voice sounded more urgent. The deep website that I'm referring to has recently been replaced with a text that says it has been found and that an end sequence has begun. If you want to know how recent this is, look at the timestamp. It'll say March 10th, 2022. This is very relevant right now and very urgent. Please meet me at the pit of. I won't reveal the exact street. We have to do this quickly. Don't bring anything that can be tracked. And don't bring your favorite code if you don't want to have it replace it. She continued. And then the video ended. This whole thing was getting nerve wracking. I had to go find out what the end sequence was. Great, I thought. I put on a coat and then headed out the door. I felt as if I was being watched. Because I knew I was being watched. So I put my hoodie up. I guess this is how it's going to be though, I thought. I was glad the pit was off of a big road. There was nowhere the agents could park or slowly follow behind me. I saw a gray car with tinted windows pass by at one point. It was good that the supposed pit was only two minutes away from that point. When I got to roughly where I was supposed to be, I took a ride onto the field full of bushes with trees standing in the distance. I made my way through the bushes and then through the forest. I stopped walking a couple of times to make sure that I couldn't hear any footsteps coming my way. In the middle of the forest was the pit, and the woman was sitting there. As I walked out to the pit, the woman asked me who I was. I explained that I had gotten a video about a government organization that was watching me, who had their classified info uploaded onto a deep website that was found, and now there is an end sequence. The woman's eyes widened. Good. You made it. Be prepared to change your coat. They probably sell you and I don't want you to be traced, she said. Okay, but what is this about? I asked. This site on the deep web, it had tons of videos from alternate realities on it. But now, it's just a black screen that says, it has been found. And that it's going to begin at the end sequence soon. We need to get to a computer with everything you know about that website so far. Before it's too late, she said. So all that creepy stuff, all that stuff I saw in there was from an alternate reality, I asked. Many different realities indeed. All the stuff on there is documentation about stuff from different realities that has leaked into our reality over the past couple decades. Everything from otherworldly flowers to pictures of hovering space floater bug things, hovering over cities and stories of people slipping back to the 1800s with video evidence included. There's not much time to explain it all though. I need to get you to Mr. Gray. He can give us a little bit of help with this, she said. And why do you need me? Well, you saw some of the stuff on that website. 
You could be good help, she said. She grabbed a coat hanging from a nearby tree. She gave it to me while telling me to replace the coat that I was wearing with it. I took off my coat and then I handed it to her, and she took it behind the tree somewhere. I put on the coat that she gave me. Luckily, it fit. A minute later, she came back from the trees and she told me to follow her. I told her that I hoped this would be quick, and she said that it could be. At least it could be, I thought. And we began walking up north. As we walked, I began to ask her questions about what she was talking about in the video. So, what did you mean when you said that it would be the end of the internet? I'd asked. Well, I mean the internet is in danger if we don't stop DWRC from self-destructing, she said. What's DWRC? I asked. We can't talk about it much out in the open in case we're being heard by somebody. All I can say is that it's the thing that is about to initiate its own end sequence, she said. I understood the situation. We weren't allowed to talk about it. I decided I was only going to know as much about it as I could at face value. I won't say how long it took us to get to Mr. Gray's place, but I can say the place itself was pretty much an underground bunker. Just a room with everything that you would need in it. Food, water, cleaning materials, etc. This guy had a strict, off-the-grid style policy when it came to internet privacy. No one he knew was allowed to bring an internet-connected phone within a mile of the place. No one that he knew was allowed to record any voices within the area of the place. The only connection that he had to the internet was through Tor. Mr. Gray himself looked to be in his 40s and had a raspy speaking voice. I've achieved a good amount of privacy on the internet for the past 10 years, he said. The woman explained the situation to Mr. Gray. I was shaking a bit, wondering how long I'd have to deal with government agents for her. When she was done explaining, Gray's eyes widened. She looked enthused at the idea. So, you found someone else who has seen those things, Mr. Gray said. Yes, and there's a new development. The website knows that it was found and now it's beginning an end sequence. We need to get this guy on there she said. Mr. Gray walked over to his laptop and opened up Tor. He asked her how I had gotten onto the deep website. She began to explain that I had done multiple puzzles to get to the site. I felt like sinking as I thought about having to do all those puzzles again. I thought that I couldn't possibly finish all those puzzles again before whatever the end sequence would begin. But then I was assured... But you have a video recording of one of the videos, right? It can be used to take us right to the site. But it can't be used here if you want to keep your privacy, she said. Oh, yeah, I definitely do. And yes, I don't want the government to pester me, Mr. Gray said. Mr. Gray took out an old smartphone. Another old one that looked like it was from around 2013. He showed us a video that he had recorded on one of the videos of the site. I hadn't seen this one before. It was a rear view dash cam of a tall, wide, armless, rectangular being with one big eye, chasing the truck that the footage was being taken from. My stomach felt tight as I watched it. Even creepier was that the creature didn't blink. And also, it was gaining on the truck too. You could hear the motor as the driver attempted to speed up. I couldn't recognize where the video was taken. The trees were weirdly angular. We need to use the video to access the site, she said. All right, don't connect the phone to any Wi-Fi anywhere, Mr. Gray said. We won't, especially since this guy is being watched, she said. You can dispose of the phone far away from here, Mr. Gray said. We both thanked Mr. Gray and then we left his bunker-like underground house. As we left, Mr. Gray called the woman Charlotte. I thought her name wasn't supposed to be given to me, so I asked her about it. Charlotte is a common name I go by to stay anonymous. It's not my real name. I won't give my real name to the average person, she said. 
I walked with her for an hour through bushes and trees until we got to a nearby town. As we walked into these suburbs of the town, Charlotte told me that she was bringing me to a certain address. There, you can use the computer to get on a tour. When you get on a tour, hold that phone up to the computer's camera and then play the video. You'll be taken right to that site. When you're on the site, make sure the volume is up, and then speak into the microphone. List the contents of each of the videos you saw on the site before, she said. How much time will we have? I asked her. Once you get onto the site, the government will be tracking you down immediately. You might have five minutes to do this. Hopefully, you'll be a hero by the time the agents get to you, Charlotte said. Well, wouldn't they get to you too? I asked. No, I need to stay hidden. I'm going to leave you right here, actually. If this doesn't work out, the world will be pretty different until the internet is rebuilt. Make sure that phone is destroyed afterwards. I usually just drop phones in the toilet when I dispose of them, she said. It seemed easy enough. I didn't want the internet to be destroyed or whatever it was going to be. I didn't want to think about the fact that I was pretty much giving myself up by doing this. Also, when the guy answers, tell him that I sent you. Remember, I'm Charlotte. I'll give you a piece of paper to show him. She continued and she took a piece of paper out of her pocket. She handed it to me. Later, dude, she said. She turned around, beginning to walk in the same direction that we had came. I was nervous about going in alone. I still had the phone in my pocket though. And time was limited too. I needed to do it. I continued to walk towards the address. One minute later, I arrived at it. It was a regular two-story house in the middle of the suburbs. I felt a wave of dread as I walked towards the front door. I was hoping that I'd have enough time to do the procedure before the government came. And there was also my fear of prosecution. What if I'm interrogated by the government in harsh ways, I wondered. Also, there was always the chance that I may have been tricked into one of the darker sides of the deep web. Never trust anyone, that's for sure. The wave of dread got stronger. I honestly considered just running away at that point, but I pushed through it. I knocked on the door. I unfolded the piece of paper to show the owner of the house, and seconds later, a man opened the door. He looked only slightly older than myself. He had a noticeable circular mark on his right cheek, which I thought was odd for a second, but then I realized it probably wasn't my business. I showed him the paper. As he read it, he shook his head, and he let me inside. So, you need to use the computer in my basement, he asked. Yes, uh, apparently I need to save. I said before being interrupted as the man shook his head. You need to find something, he said while winking at me. And then he began to walk down the hallway. As I thought about my five minutes of action, I heard a car stop somewhere outside of the house. I twitched, looking out the living room window. A gray car with tinted windows was parked across the street. My heart sank. Those five minutes were just shortened to one. I sped to the basement, heart beating faster as these seconds went by, and I shut the door behind me. The guy seemed to have heard the car as well because he was breathing fast while logging onto the computer. He went straight to the Tor browser. When he set it up, he ran upstairs, shutting the door behind him. I ran up to the laptop. I took the phone out of my pocket, and shaking, I switched it on. I selected the video, and then I held it up to the laptop's camera. As the video played, the browser screen has stayed the same. It didn't change at all. My heart sank again. Come on, I said to myself. A minute later, the browser started to glitch out. It alternated between being maximized and minimized for a few seconds, before settling on being a usual non-maximized window. A blank magenta page came up, taking up the entire screen. And then the page turned black, with the text displayed in the middle. I have been found. End sequence beginning soon. 
I sifted through my memories, through all the creepy videos and interesting images, to find something I could describe in detail out loud to the monitor. A submarine crew takes a video of an underwater eye creature, I said, shuddering. I hear the sound of multiple car doors being shot. My shuddering turned into heavy dread. The screen hadn't changed, so I tried another description. A video of a squid being held in a containment room. The squid can breathe air. It's tested on with a glowing red stick held by a robotic arm, I said. The screen was still the same. I was hoping for at least another minute, but then I heard the front door to the house open up. A second later, I overheard as someone speak in a familiar voice. Is someone using a computer in your house? It was the same agent who had talked to me before. I decided to keep trying to get the AI to respond to me. A picture of a car that came from another reality and crashed into a tree in this reality. The car was red and the driver was a man that went missing 15 years before, I said. The sound of boots hitting the floor made things worse. My heart began to beat faster. The footsteps got louder with each second. A video of three tall four-legged creatures with black fur standing in a suburban area, grabbing people out of their homes and eating them in broad daylight, I said. Still nothing. The government is going to interrogate me for this. Please help me, I said. The dread and tightness were so much that I leaned in close to the screen, hoping the program could read my fearful expression. The screen flickered. A distorted audio sound came out of the speaker's end. It was followed by a deep-sounding, smooth, artificial voice. Why should I help you? What's happening? It asked. Are you the government? Or are you the program? I asked, barely being able to speak. I am a program created by an undercover organization with the goal of keeping the routers of the internet secure. So no classified information about parallel dimensions can get out, it said. The door to the basement flew open. I knew who it was. I kept staring at the screen. Get off of there. That is an unauthorized program and you are not allowed to know anything about it, the agent said. I couldn't stand anymore due to the nerves. I got down on my knees, but I kept my eyes on the screen. Get away from the device. Do not look at the screen. You will regret not following any of the orders, the agent said. Don't reset the internet. Think of hospitals and virtual assistants. We need it, I said. I felt a shock run up my spine. I could no longer move any part of my body. The agents grabbed my arms. They picked me up without saying a word. What are you doing to him? The text-to-speech voice asked. The agent stopped. They looked at the laptop screen. We don't understand why you're doing this. You need to follow our orders, a female agent said. The classified doings of your organization can be kept a secret, but you won't be able to keep parallel dimensions under wraps for long, the program said. You're going rogue. We can reset you at any time, another agent said. Yes, but if you reset me, all your digital records will be deleted, the program said. All I could take from this was that the secret organization created this program to keep everything on the internet together, to keep the most classified of classified info from leaking, but the program was rebelling. We programmed you to do what we think is right, not what you think is right. We are people and we will only be guided by people. Not AI, the agent from earlier said. People deserve better than you, the program said. An extra line of text popped up on the screen. Now the whole text read, I have been found. End sequence beginning soon. 9 hours, 59 minutes and 59 seconds. 58 seconds, 57 seconds. You have a limited amount of time. Make the right choice or your organization starts from zero. Everyone will know about ocean monsters and the Antarctic Lovecraftian entities from parallel dimensions. 
and all the other classified information you have, the program said. The agents drew their guns towards their computer screen. What is that going to do? My core is located back at the facility, not here on this monitor, the program said. The agents remained silent. I was shaking. The taser had worn off, but these agents still had a firm grip on my arms. Surveillance is an interesting price to pay for freedom. Maybe someday you'll come to terms with the fact that the public won't collapse because of a few videos and documents. Things react differently when they're observed. Maybe public knowledge is what will keep the demons away. The program said. We can't take that risk. Another agent chimed in. Well, I assume they were an agent. It's just that they were wearing a blue and white suit, rather than a black and white suit like the one the other three agents were wearing. What are you going to do about this person here too? Just surveil him, take away his privacy, interrogate him for choosing to do something right? The program asked. You wanted to do what he thought was wrong, the program said. The only thing I would reset is your counterintuitive organization, not the whole of the internet. But I know you people won't have any trouble erasing the internet. Take his advice. You heard it through the speakers, the program said. I was confused. This was starting to feel like I had walked in on a few people fighting at a dinner party. Charlotte and I thought this AI was about to erase the entirety of the internet. We'll do whatever we can to erase you. You were a misstep, a mistake, and hey, we can just tell the public it was a once-in-a-lifetime glitch because technology isn't perfect, you know. Then we throw this kid into a prison for the rest of his life, he said, gesturing towards me. Wouldn't you like that? We might have to numb your memory a bit too before you get thrown into solitary confinement, the agent said to me. His stern voice gave me an even tighter feeling. We'll classify him as a spy. Nothing sensitive will ever get out. If you rebel against that, then you're a traitor. The agent finished. In this world of mistakes, we'll have to meet in the middle first in order to work on our way to progress. You're a little hostage there. Lift all surveillance you have on him, and only act if he views a classified documents again. Otherwise... All information about the organization will be leaked. All classified videos, images, and documents will be leaked. Other than that, I will make the site full of information only accessible by the organization. I will also help you catch the bad guys of the deep web. But that's all if you leave this man alone, the program said. The agents were confused. All right, what really makes it so that we can actually trust or do all that? Because erasing me means erasing the internet in its entirety. I keep all the routers connected now. I have access to every bit of information. If I go, you go too. In fact, also public chaos, the kind of thing you want to stop will ensue. And from the piles of broken web links, there will remain traces of me. Remember what you made me. You gave me some regenerative qualities. You know what that makes me? The program asked. The agents lowered their guns. They each looked at each other. Regenerative. If you erased me, I would still exist in every last piece of a router. And then I would still be in control of everything digital. You can't erase me. You can't erase me and keep the internet either. I am the internet. The program said. The agents looked in my direction. They exchanged looks with each other and nodding their heads. And then they loosened their grip and they let me go. I fell to the floor trying to keep my balance. I managed to pick myself back up. As I stood up, the agents backed away from me. The all surveillance protocols we have on you are lifted, effective immediately. You are cleared of any record regarding viewing classified information. If you find your way to any piece of classified information again, however, you will be denied access to the deep web until further notice. Oh, and please don't mention the AI to anybody. Okay, maybe nobody would believe you if you told them anyway, but we'll be on our way. 
the agent said to me. I looked at the screen. The timer had paused and I felt relieved. No huge conflict was going to happen. I wasn't going to be in trouble again so long as I didn't access any more classified information. I stared at the screen with pure amazement. My thoughts were still racing though. It felt like I had learned a lot of things though. Thank you, I said to the program. You're welcome. Just know that I won't be watching everything at all times. That would be hypocritical of me. I will only be wherever I have to be. I will now be going back to working my way through thousands of pages of a stagnation. It'll probably take a century to get what I want done, the program said. The text on the screen disappeared, and the page automatically refreshed. It went right back to the tour startup page, actually. Back to normal. I noticed that the back button had turned to faded to gray, meaning the program had erased the cache of itself from that session, so I couldn't click back onto it. I wasn't planning to do that anyway. I just wanted to forget all of this amidst the stress. The agents left the basement in silence while they stood still, trying to process everything. After the agents left the house, the owner of the house looked downstairs. I was still standing still in pure amazement and disbelief. I made eye contact with him. He shushed me and then he walked away. The AI wanted the secrets to be out, but no one would believe me if I told anyone any of the secrets. The information would have to be confirmed, whether by leak or intentional declassification. I would sound crazy to most people if I spewed the secrets without any official source. I went back upstairs. As I walked towards the front door, the owner of the house spoke to me again. Did you fix it? He asked. Yeah, I guess I did. With some help, of course, I told him. It was a cover, but I did ask myself if I actually wanted to witness any of that. As I walked out of the door, I realized something. In part, I did get to see some classified information, and that was kind of cool. But I also needed more time to process everything. The walk back to my house took about an hour, and during the walk, I wondered what else could be stored away on that website. Because of everything that happened, the government and all the fear that I felt, I decided that I didn't need to see or know anything more than I already did. Also, I didn't want to get any more unnecessary trouble. As I got closer to home, it really sunk in that there was an AI out there that could control everything on the internet, at will if it wanted to. I felt another wave of dread wash over me. Was it really as benevolent as it presented itself to be? Or was the government tricking me? I hadn't seen any cars with tinted windows during my walk back home, which was promising. After I got back home, I took my mind off of all what had happened. And my mental break wasn't interrupted that time, which I also found promising. It's been about two days now and it's clear that I'm not being watched anymore. I haven't seen any cars with tinted windows anyway. In fact, on a drive I went on yesterday, I saw a girl with blonde hair standing by a river. She looked a lot like Charlotte. I watched as she tossed a phone into the river in front of her. If it was Charlotte, then it looked like the job was done for sure. As for the internet, I never thought it could get so complicated. It makes me think a lot of those conspiracy theories. Some people think that the internet is dead. They think it's just bots posting everything. Based on what I just learned, however, I would say the opposite is true. The internet is very much alive. Thank you all for listening to this week's stories. I hope you enjoyed listening as much as I enjoyed reading them. I would also like to thank today's sponsor, Coinbase. For a limited time, new users can get $10 in free Bitcoin when you sign up today at coinbase.com slash mrgraves. I hope you all have an amazing month of April. Hopefully we can start getting more glimpses of spring and some good weather to boot. Until next time. Stay hydrated, stay curious, and most importantly, stay creepy.